Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Welcome to the slightly more makeshift of environments that is our new podcast studio to make sure we're COVID compliant. And guess who's back? Back again. None other than Mr. Blair for part two. Of Thanks for having me again. Always a pleasure, mate. Um, I think the last part, well, we probably covered everything up until you started at Nash, yeah. pretty much. So we're going to continue on from that point, mate. But before we do that, you enjoy the first one? I haven't listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> I've... You didn't send it to me in terms of, Alan, check this out. Are you happy with all of this? Which I kind of like, Hassan. Yeah. If you'd have sent it to me, I'd be like, no, delete that, remove that. Don't, I don't want to say that. And yeah. So anyone that has listened to it, it's unedited. Um, you, you did, I, I think that's the format of all guests, isn't it? They don't get yeah. it privy to. No, I don't, unless it's requested. I don't like it just purely because it's a nice conversation. I think realistically... If I thought there was anything that was a bit naughty in there, maybe. But I, I like the honesty. I like the rawness of it. And it was it was spot on. As the feedback shows, mate, people have loved it. Yeah, so on that basis, no, I haven't listened to it. I probably never will. Um, it's like the Sipography interview I did before Christmas. I've not seen that. Um, it's only things like the, the bigger films that I watch. But I've never watched a finished thing. So I've never sat down and watched. Nah, never. Because A, it's like super vain. And B, it's like up until that point of launching of a, a bigger film and stuff, I might have watched it half a dozen times at various stages. I completely know the nuts and bolts and gist of, of the film. I've made so many changes in that. The last thing I want to do is sit down and watch. So, yeah, no, I haven't listened to this one. Chloe, on the other hand, she, she has. I've mentioned it to you before we started recording. He's not mentioned it to me, right? Cut here straight away because she's been on the phone talking <laughs> She's giving him an absolute dressing down, mate. I've never seen... Besotted? <laughs> Fucking besotted? I weren't besotted with you. She don't speak like that, but... No, nah, she was... Um, Less than happy? She, 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 <laughs> she, nah, she, she basically made a bit of a song and dance of it. I weren't besotted, like... But she did go to bed, like, saying to me, I'm still as besotted as I ever was. No, so, nah, it was really nice, man. It was really nice. Absolute um, worldies. Yeah, d you know, we had a lovely chat. I enjoyed talking to you. I did walk away feeling that because I'm not looking at a script or whatever, I definitely missed probably 40% of what I had uh, talked about. But that's all right. You know, I covered those early years um, and I'm sure today's going to be pretty similar, Hassan. I've... I've yeah. gone through the, the, the rigmarole of trying to remember what's occurred over the last sort of 14 odd years. Um, and um, I've got like sort of government dossier of Nash <laughs> Times. It's probably like four or five pages worth paper clipped together. Um, so there's a lot there, mate. But essentially, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about or try and sort of conceptualise everything that's happened mm -hmm. in Nash. So let's pick up from where we left off, which is you accepting the job yeah. from Kev yeah. and you being involved, we said loosely as a marketing manager, I believe. Yeah, Kev would probably recall better than I, but I came down here, there was no marketing department. I suppose it's probably important to explain that to people. Pre um, me coming along, any sort of marketing related matters. So back then it would have been submitting maybe an advert to a magazine, liaising with um, sponsored anglers or people that were promoting the brand. It was all kind of done by Kev yeah. and Gary to a degree and maybe other people in the office, but um, it was such a small business compared to what it is now back then that there was no marketing manager. There was no marketing department. There yeah. was So when I say marketing manager, it wasn't like uh, we sacked our previous one and we're appointing a new one. It was like, it was probably Kev realising that times were changing. Um, maybe... You couldn't rely solely now on having phenomenal products, um, which he can take the credit for 40 odd years of producing, you know, changed the game in so many instances. Yeah, having right. those was one thing, you know, having a good distribution network was another thing, but you also needed to, to bang a drum. People mm -hmm. needed to be informed, you know, about these great products and where they could get those from and stuff. So yeah, I was brought in in the loosest terms to really work alongside Kev as the marketing department, yeah. you know. So what age are you now? Uh, 24. So you're 24. Yeah. And what are your thoughts on, obviously, your sort of colourful <laughs> lecturing career has sort of come to the point where you've now gone over to Nash. What are your thoughts in that space of time? Did you see that as like a 
get out almost? Or did you see that as, th- right, this is me for the future now indefinitely? No, because I spoke last time, you know, I felt, I never wanted to be a lecturer. Yeah. We talked about it last time. I worked really hard. I threw everything at it and was, you know, run, doing multiple jobs at the same time. Talked about the bar management, looking after the students as a warden, function managing the weddings. I've always just graft, graft, graft. Yes, it was an escape from all of that. It was a restart, a reset button. Um, um, I didn't like the red tape that it, it was going that way more. And I know you've had personal experience yeah. working in schools and stuff. It just didn't really suit me. You just want to teach the students the way you think they should be taught, but mm. that's not always the correct way and stuff. So it wasn't a career choice. It just, I fell into that role. Thanks to Chris again, massive yeah. wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him and the opportunities he gave me, but I didn't see it as a long term career choice, you know, to work in, in education. Um, but conversely, and we touched on this last time, I didn't see a career choice working at Nash Tackle <laughs> right. either. Nor did a, you know, I ever really see myself. I, I don't know, Hassan. Yeah. I just knew at that age, you know, 24, 23, however, if I work really, really hard, I'm going to earn good money and I can do the nice things I want to in life. Yeah. So this was like another opportunity to earn good money. And I would go and see where it took me. Yeah. And you, ref- you remember back to last time, Kev asked me that really poignant question, one of three, but what am I going to be doing in five years from now? Well, I'm going to be working. And I kind of still thought, go and do it, mm. put, throw everything into it and see where it takes you and, and, and see what happens and stuff. So that's what I did. I embraced a, a new chapter, a new yeah. opportunity. Yeah. So talk us through how that started then. Because it, was it just yourself really took the job as well, didn't he? Was he at Nash? No, at so I, I I actually was going to give really a quick call before this just to double check. I think how it was back then, Tom had already been working for Nash for a couple of years before I joined. Yeah. But that was based out in France at Cavagnac at the French Lake. So he's been out there already two years as a baby. He finished his fisheries course at Shuttleworth yeah. and... Um, he chose his work placement, going back to that thing again, picked the right placement. He chose it to be at Cavagnac. And he was one of those great examples of a fantastic student that mm. shone, grafted, went above and beyond. That employer, in this case, Nash Tackle, were yeah. like, wow, when did you finish? Would you like to come and work for us? So he literally walked out of college and walked into a, to a great job. We need somebody to murder our koi piece. <laughs> if you've listened to that <laughs> podcast, you'll, you'll know what Hassan's referring to there. So Tom did that for a couple of years, pre me even getting my job and I think this is a bit I wanted to double check I think Reedy had already been here a few months so he would have finished around July time he also did his work placement at Nash Tackle and at the end of his um, two years college education they offered him a job he could have been here longer than that he might have even been a year longer but that's how I remember it I should have really double checked those facts so when I joined um, it I basically can't remember my first day, unlike the, the, the yeah. cutting of the horse leg. I remember it like, I don't really remember my first day. I would presume it would have been something along the lines of I would have arrived, um, spent however much time with Kev and then just gone around. Like your induction, Hassan, you yeah. meet the other members of staff, where are the toilets, where's the kettle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the early memories I do recall were, it was Reedy and I living together. So we were both living in the lodge. I don't know if you're aware of this, but... The Church Lake Lodge. The Church Lake Lodge. So there's um, a lovely little lodge up there. And it is nothing more than a lodge. Uh, it's on stilts. It's in between the church and the Copse Lake. And that became my home. Wow. Um, I'm sort of two... I was two hours away up in Bedfordshire or yeah. even further if I if I had gone back home and stuff in the Milton Keynes area. So I'm now living in a lodge, log cabin uh, with Reedy. Um, and we were having the bestest of times. Okay. Like, you know, we had the decks up there, we had a quad bike, we had the rifles, and we had two lakes with really big fish in that we would observe and watch and feed floaters, and work was a, a short walk back down every morning and stuff, and it really was nice. Yeah. Um, I'd already been living with Chloe a couple of years at this point, so I'd kind of leave her back up home. She actually moved back into her parents' house. Um, we'd been living together for a couple of years because... Sorry, babe. <laughs> basically, um, I was having too much of a good time down here with Reedy. And I'm basically telling her, even though it wasn't the case at the time, yeah, I'm not sure, Clay, this job's for me. You know, I want to take it really slow just to keep her and let me have a little bit of freedom. boy freedom with Reedy. <laughs> yeah. And so I managed to keep um, Clay back up that way for about eight months. And I lived in the lodge with Reedy. In that short period of time, um, 
Matt Downing also joined the company. Yeah, wow. Um, he then moved into the lodge. Tom came back from France because the company's growing. It's it just yeah. growing and growing and growing, even in such a short period. And it was like, Tom, we don't need you out there anymore. Come back to England. You're more valuable here now working. Um, Greg, another one of my students, he came down and started working for us. So there's now five of us living in, in this In the lodge? Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it was is awesome. ridiculous. It's like it was a frat awesome. house, like a carpet how, frat house. How, what would you say, Hassan? 15 metres, no, 12 metres long by five, six metres. So we all had our little allocated areas of our bed chairs. And some of those bed chairs, they would have to be folded at certain times of the day to give people access to the kitchen or the shower. It's, It was great, you know. You're living with really good friends yeah. in a really great environment. Kev was obviously very kind, you know, because mm. none of us could afford to start renting just like that and stuff. And I suppose none of us really wanted to take the risk to invest in a, a long-term you know, a 12 month lease on a property or and stuff. So anyway, he was really kind that he just let us all pitch up in, in between yeah. his two lakes. Yeah. Hey, child, have a field day now. Like <laughs> it wouldn't happen. <laughs> it goes back to that thing again, you know, times changing and stuff. Yeah. But so yeah, those early days, it was as a business, it was, it was small in compared to what it was now. Yeah. Like really small. So much so that I knew everyone's name. I knew what their hobbies where I knew where they're fishing this is over a period of time and yeah. I could walk around here anywhere on site and chat with people and you know we were very cliche like a family mm. very much a family run business Kev was the boss Sarah was sort of the the mum of the operation so much so that for many years while she worked here no one called her Sarah she was always called mother or mum <laughs> yeah you know yeah. and th that was the sort of structure the hierarchy and and people worked hard and we did yeah, we, we did what we did. We, yeah. we developed fishing tackle and we, we shipped it out from here. You know, the lorries would come here and we'd fill the lorries up every evening and they'd go out and stuff. And so back to my own role in, in all of that, you know, Kev, from the, the day I joined, he devoted huge chunks of the day, sometimes all day, to be just spending time with me and I suppose giving me as much of his previous knowledge and experience of Nash, of the industry, of everything to do with carp fishing that he possibly could, he, it, it just poured out of him and, and stuff. And um, yeah, he mentored me, you know, because you got to remember like as much as yeah, I did work hard, mm. you know, I didn't have any previous real industry experience um i've got no marketing background or marketing experience not that kev did either you know but we would just sit there for hours and hours each day talking working planning uh, and making things happen it was probably one of the the earliest sayings that he uh, not drilled into me it, it was just obvious you know and i suppose i'd already adopted it through most of my life anyway you know yeah we want to do this this is the route to do it we're going to make that happen, you know, and, and that saying still stays within the company quite profoundly and strongly to this day, you know, make it happen, yeah. you know, do it, go and do it, it's you know. It's a big and call from Kev though, if you think about it, because obviously he's, it's changing times, yep. things are moving on, yep. but you've not necessarily got the background in marketing, like you said, yep. and he's putting a lot into you yep. that potentially could be could be wasted if it yeah. doesn't fit and you yeah. don't get on you, you're gone or whatever else and, and at any point he could have just got rid of me yeah. you know like you can with with most members of staff if they're not performing and stuff yeah um i quickly i don't know how quickly it wouldn't have been within the first weeks or or even months but what happened at some point in those first few years is that answer i'd given him where i'd refer to yeah i'll be doing something on my own he gave me so many opportunities and he gave me so much freedom and he listened to me. You know, he wasn't like a, you do this. Do yeah. it. He listened to my opinions and it just gave me a lot of freedom to feel like I was my own boss making decisions. And then I started to, you know, I wasn't making decisions just based on my job or my task. I'm thinking about the bigger picture in the business and, I don't know, he just mentored me like... Did you find that easy to think about the business considering you hadn't been in it or the industry for, for that we're long? We're probably jumping, you know, to yeah. maybe three years in advance now. But I suppose what it was, was it was like, what am I going to do? Yeah. Have I actually got a seriously good opportunity here? Bearing in mind, all I love is angling yeah. and I haven't got 
you know, if I take the partying out of it and the music and stuff, I could have pursued that, but I hadn't. All my jobs from the age of 13 had been angling related, angling, fishing, 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 fishing. So I'd got to this point now where how much of a better position in fishing could one get? Mm. Really? Yeah, no. You know, I, and, and that's where I was at, Hassan. I was like, do I love fishing? Yeah, I love it. It's everything to me. Have I made it my job? Yes. Okay, right. Snap out of this, going to go and do something else. I'm never going to get a better op yeah, opportunity. I'm all in. Yeah, yeah. I'm never going to get a better opportunity. And at some point, I must have just made that yeah. subconscious decision that, no, that's it now. I'm in this for forever, for the long haul. And, and it just got, you know, it, it exaggerated it more and more and more over the years to the point where, where we are now and stuff. But Did you ever worry initially that, like, it would ruin angling for your working in it or not? Mm. I know you'd worked in it lecture. It has done. It's ruined, you know, my fishing's been ruined many times over the last mm. 14 years. There's been long, long periods of time where I haven't gone. Mm. Uh, even if we take this year, for example, or sorry, last year, just gone 2000, yeah. I did five weeks um, through the summer, which is your prime Alan Blair, bread bomb, yeah. sauna, bunch of maggots, yeah. you know, five weeks, never touched the rod. Wow. You know, because work had to take priority and stuff. So I've had plenty of periods over this journey where my fishing has been ruined, but it, it, it's bigger than that. You know, yeah. I can go fishing next week or next year or whenever. I've got a lifetime of fishing ahead of me. Sometimes I've had to make choices yeah. um, and, and those choices are something takes priority in this. In, in many instances, it would work. Um, so I'm thinking back to you lads all in a lodge, yeah. quite a, a tight, Bunch of lads, yep. quite enjoy a party, yep. enjoy some sort of lively times, yep. and then the responsibility of sort of the development of Nash Tackle, and yep. not necessarily seeing that always sort of marry it. What sort of shenanigans went on? Was there any blurred lines between sort no, of work not, and partying? No, not really. It, it was pretty, it was just nice to be, you know, I basically come from either spending two years living with Chloe, but even then we were living in a house with those girls I, I'd mentioned yeah. previously when I first moved there. It was kind of share a big, big property on this estate and we all live. So I'd kind of basically spent three years living with girls. Yeah, I'd now got this opportunity to live with four other lads, yeah. not just any lads. I'm not moved. These are lads I already know. We've yeah. already got this fan. And it was just brilliant, Hassan. You know, we would... We would party, we would have parties in the lodge, but we would talk about work, we would talk about our careers. We all had a common goal yeah. in, in terms of our work and then we'd fish together and, yeah, we, you know, fishing. The first session I did down here, um, this is pre-sort of Matt joining, pre-Greg joining. Um, the first night session, I, I recall, I definitely didn't fish for the first few weeks, maybe even the first cut. I was like, no, just work, Alan, just show your... Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, can, yeah. Can I go fishing now? Like, can I, I get on the church? Yeah, yeah, can, <laughs> well, exactly right, exactly. So my first ever session with uh, was with Reedy. Yeah. We had some mega sessions over the years, but this particular one, um, basically tapping Basie's brain, girl, girl, tell us something good to go. Tell us something. We're, we're all keen and eager and that. Don't yeah. know the lay of the land at all. And... Um, Gary basically said he knew a little bit about me and what, well, both me and Reedy actually, we'd done a lot of sessions, river fishing, carp fishing, back up where we lived and stuff in the past and that. And he said, I know this little river. It's going to be right up your lad's street. Um, it's less than 10 minutes from here, the Perfect. offices. Perfect. Tell us more, Gary. Tell us more. Tell us more. Yeah, I've had them to this big and there's this one particular bridge and it's scalloped out a little bit deeper and, and they live there and... We're buzzing. <laughs> 10 minutes from our door, loads of carp in a river. You know, I'd come from not such prolific river carp fishing. Yeah. You know, you might go sessions and sessions and sessions about catching one and stuff. Um, so we're like, wow, man, what a... What? So we got the exact details, which lay by to park in, you know, where to walk, how to get into this particular spot. And we went there one evening um, and we basically did exactly as Gary suggested. Um, but Gary hadn't, build a scene on on all the details and what went on to happen was we got our rods out and oh, I don't know, 10 11 o'clock or whatever we've we've crashed out for the night yeah we were awoken oh, no. a few hours later to some beeps or whatever and Reedy's right next to me we sort of two brollies up and that and I, I never forget it man I remember like looking out like laying down looking out of the the bed chair in there and I can just see I was using the nevels at the time yeah I think they were purple and I could just see these three purple LEDs lit up, 
But the more I looked and rubbed my eyes, they were actually underwater. Oh, no. And we were like about two inches away from it coming into the bed chairs, that close. Wow. Um, we frantically packed up. <laughs> um, I had to leave the bite alarms there. Um, really? I, I was using the butt locks, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Fantastic. If I hadn't have had them butt locks, gone. 100 rods were gone. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Because what it actually transpired was this wasn't just any old river. It was a tidal river. Gary deliberately, <laughs> and I will say deliberately, hadn't provided that piece of fucking vital information. He stitched you up. Yeah, he stitched up. Yeah, he stitched up. And I learned a lot about Gal after that time. And that's, you know, he, he's one of the nice blokes you'll ever, yeah. ever, ever meet. But he loves a bit of banter. Like, and too young, naive, <laughs> out of their depth. <laughs> Think their car panglers turn up in Essex? I'll show them, lad. So he did. He stitched yeah. us up. Yeah. So I remember having to leave the bite alarms. I think Reedy left his alarms as well. And <gasps> for whatever reason, we couldn't get back into Nash that night. And I, I remember, like, we had to drive all the way to Southend. We had to go to Tesco's because we're soaked now. Like, yeah. to the, we've waded around trying to get. We went and bought some clothes out of a twenty-four hour Tesco's, dressed ourselves in the car park, and I think we <laughs> sat in the car like freezing, but trying to walk. And that was my first ever. Night fishing, tripping. What an sense. omen that is, mate. Yeah, it was good. I, I since went back and it was, as Gary exactly had said, a very yeah. prolific, lovely bit of river. The particular spot he mentioned was the best bit on the stretch. Just don't set up underneath the bridge where we've been informed we needed to be, that you know, because it's tidal. That's brilliant isn't it? Um, and yeah, it went on from there. My fishing in those, those early year or early years um, was very fragmented and disjointed mm. and I'm trying to be juggled should I be working should I be fishing because you want to make an impression at the same time I can catch him honestly Kev I can catch him yeah um so you try and prove yourself um I was still doing a lot of trips back home to to Sheraton Pitts which we discussed last yeah. time yeah, yeah. um yeah I was better I had better equipment and I had access to bait now so pre-baiting had become more of a tangible thing but then at that time I remember it being winter and I was over baiting in the winter and then I was flitting around on day tickets and I didn't really have a home um Kev basically um he did something really kind and generous um and, and he got me a manor ticket right which is obviously a very prestigious yeah. water for this particular area so he, he's forked out for a manor ticket he's like, I want you to you know go and do some proper yeah. carp fishing yeah. and, and concentrate. And he taught me back then the importance of, um, you know, having a home, mm. having somewhere to go to, having somewhere to learn, having somewhere to understand them and having targets, having something to uh, want to aspire to and achieve and stuff. So he's got me this manor ticket. Um, yeah, I did three nights. I never went back <laughs> ever. I hated it. And it was in the middle of winter. Gal still had a ticket at the time. Um, and I remember going there. It, have you been to the manor? I've you, been to the airport. Yeah, definitely. It's like, it's probably one of the most uninspiring places mm. that I've personally ever chucked a carp rod out in. Um, the stock, yeah, ridiculous. Amazing, yeah. It just was the depths of winter. It's mm. an irrigation reservoir, so the banks. You know, if you want to get down anywhere near the water's edge, boggy, horrible. Yeah. And yeah, it was just on my part. I, I weren't I weren't good enough. I know that's the reason. I you, didn't. I didn't give it long enough. Didn't give it yeah. enough chance. And even if I had done all that would have happened, Hassan, we would have got into the spring, and it would have got busy, real busy. And I would be f like at the bottom end of ability in comparison to the other anglers on there and their wealth of experience and stuff. So yeah, my my manner <laughs> campaign three was very sessions. free overnighters. So that's arriving at dark, packing up at dark, coming to work, and <clears throat> I just had no love for it. You know, yeah, I think yeah. It, 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 it took me a many years to realise it's the importance of enjoyment, you yeah. know, not going to try and prove something to Kev, not going to get likes on Instagram. You know, it's really important for me anyway that I go because I love fishing yeah, and I want to enjoy it. So it, that wasn't... Um, what, what was what was sort of... I don't know. You said there, I, c I can completely empathise with you flitting around and sort of trying to balance establishing yourself in work but also a bit of fishing in amongst it when you can mm. what was the the day-to-day -day sort of role for you was there a responsibility for you to actively go out angling or was it more about sort of product making it sort of appeal in magazines or whatever it may be what, what was it like yeah, it was both Hassan and I think yeah. that was something that was proper drummed into me by Kev but I was also very aware myself like 
number of different questions there, but like, let's talk about me going fishing. Mm. It's incredibly hypocritical. You know, it's why I started fishing so hard back at the college, standing there, lecturer, preaching, t- t- yeah. back it. Don't like, yeah. you know, I'd hate it myself if someone was talking to me in, in such a way that you didn't do the do what you're saying you do and stuff. So yeah. I was really conscious that I needed to up my carp fishing ability and I needed to catch fish because to be in the position I'm in, um, it's only right and proper that, you know, I, I suppose it's similar now to like keyboard warriors or something. Mm. You're giving it the big un. But can you actually deliver? You've and, got to back it up. Can yeah. you back it? Can yeah. you back it? So I felt the onus on me. Kev also explained the importance as I progressed and, you know, he mentored me more and more. I needed it too for my development. Yeah. You know, I needed to really understand carp fishing. I needed to get better at it um, so people would listen to me and respect what I was saying, mm. you know. Um, going back to the other question, what was my day-to-day role? Oh, it's really hard to remember Hassan, but definitely for the first year, year and a half, possibly even two years, it was pretty much solely marketing uh, orientated. And back then, it guys so different to now. Yeah. You know, I just, I just had to really worry about magazines. Yeah, what content did Nash have represented in a magazine? Um, so I'd basically plan those schedules, work with the editors and, and the, the team at those particular mags to ensure we were getting the greatest coverage we could based on advertising spend, yep. which let's make no bones about it. That's what it was. Um, we had a small team of anglers, really small in fact. So it was certainly in the, the early days, it was my responsibility to go and try and accrue a stronger however you dress it up, promotional team, yep. marketing team of anglers representing the brand. Um, shows, but you know, back yeah. then it was just the NEC. I remember going and doing the NEC with Gary and and stuff. Yeah. So we didn't have these yeah. loads of different shows and exhibitions. Uh, Nash back then we were in Europe, but there was many territories we weren't in. For example, we did very very little in France back then, and certainly almost nothing, definitely nothing in in those sort of further Eastern European countries. Um, but Back then, on the on the flip side, of that, there was a lot of magazines. Yeah, as you'll know, mate. You yeah. know, if you just taught carp titles, there was probably approximately eight to ten dedicated carp titles just in the UK. Um, then you had the course titles, which we wanted a representation in as well. Then you had the mags in Europe, so it was certainly a busy enough job for me juggling all of that, yeah. along with uh, an ang- a team of anglers and and stuff. Yeah. So you must have forged some pretty good relationships with regards to other people around the industry, especially that work in magazines. Because yeah. a lot of people, I mean, Ollie, for example, he started in magazines and then yeah. he's come into a company. So all that sort of structure, learning the ins and outs or the working of the industry and, yeah. and, and how different magazines operate, something you, you sort of enjoyed doing and strategically, did you lead that or was there a lot of input from Kev with regards There's to There's a lot of that? input from Kev in terms of... I think no. I, I retract. Kev and I were both learning on our feet. Yeah, you know, and no more so than the years that went on after that with with the you know the launch of other marketing platforms and that. You know, it, it, it's always just been about getting on and jumping on something, realizing the importance of something, whether that be a free promotional DVD, mm. whether that mean more elaborate show stands, whether that means different territories and the marketing. That it just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make it happen. <laughs> Make it happen. He would identify something and it would then kind of, because bearing in mind, you know, we're talking about a man here that was giving me all the time in the world, yeah. but was still running every other part of the business yeah. to a degree. You know, he, you know, he is Kevin Nash. It is his business. And he gave me a lot of time, but he also had to be active everywhere else. Um, so, yeah, once he'd given me the time we discussed we'd made some plans then it would be for me to then go and make it happen yeah back to that same saying again what are your first impressions of kev because obviously like you said to me back end of the last podcast you were like i didn't really know i knew he was a good angler but i didn't really know kev and i've known probably coming to work here sort of his reputation maybe more so yeah what were your sort of early impressions of him so this whole reputation thing, yeah. I didn't know anything about that. Yeah. Um, so I came in with a very, very um, blank canvas, so to speak. Yeah, I, I, I ain't got a bad word to say about him. No. I really haven't. And, but, but a lot of people warned me. 
if you yeah. speak to a magazine editor, if you speak to a particular retailer, but I, I never saw it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting there going, he's like, he's a saint. He's never yeah. shouted at me. He's never given me a bollocking because I've had many bollockings. What was the first bollocking? I can't remember how so. No? But like, <laughs> no, I can't remember. There's been loads. There's been loads. loads. But then I always look at it, you know, he's such a father figure or an older yeah. brother or whatever you want to word it. No different to my dad giving me a bollocking when I've been a twat or like done something genuinely wrong. And what, what the key things with Kev, and I learned this from a very, very, you know, very, very quickly. He's got a few good sayings. Um, you're only a twat if you do it twice. So, and, and it's really right, Hassan, you know, yeah. everyone can make mistakes. You know, it's what you do after that, how you learn from those mistakes. Um, so that's something that I've been really conscious of with Kev. Um, he's also definitely loves the, don't tell me I haven't got enough time. Mm. You know, and I've tried to install that in all the members of staff that have come, you know, since I joined. Don't ever tell Nashi. Well, I'm oh, sorry, Kev, I didn't have enough time. Kev, don't mind if you haven't got enough time. If you go to him a few days or a week beforehand and say, Kev, can I just sit down with you? I've just outline, here's the problem, here's a possible solution, how I could get... If you do that with him, he massively respects you. But if on the day something was supposed to be done, mm. you know, it's those words. If I ever hear someone say, oh, God, no, you've done it. You... Sorry, didn't have enough time, you know, which it, I make him right. It's not a good enough excuse or reason because mm. if you'd have talked to people beforehand, there might have been ways and means to sort it out. Yeah, to exactly. sort it out. Um, yeah, I just, I can't, yeah. I, I couldn't see the, some of the things that people were saying, you know, um, because he's just always gone above and beyond to give me so much time and, and mentoring and stuff. But, you know, on the flip side of that, when I've the, bucked up or whatever I've, I've had a bollocking yeah. um, and I've always t taken those bollockings as yeah you can go and sit in the corner and cry about it you can go and call him every name under the sun or you can go actually he's got much more experience than me mm. he's probably talking sense he's probably right I'm going to really sit and think about what he said to me and I'm going to act on it and yeah. that's all I've ever done you know um, I think if Kev was sitting here now, he'd be able to turn around and go, yep, yeah, you made lots of mistakes, Alan. You were very young, very naive, but you did listen to me, you know, and yeah, I don't know what more you can do than that. No, no, it's fair. Yeah. It's, no, it's, it's an interesting start of a relationship as well because it's very like, you look at it from like an employee staff point of view, but it's deeper than that from the get-go, isn't uh, it? Mate? Really deeper than that. Like yeah. really, really deeper than that. When you're sitting with someone... Yeah from the moment, you know, work starts till the end. And and because he lived on site, because I lived on site, you know, I might be here, he'd be coming up to see me at the weekend. Mm. Uh, he'd be coming in the evening to talk to me while I'd be working late. You you don't really get away from each other, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, no. Fantastic, like, yeah, um, you know, you, I, I say I don't know Kev. I didn't know Kev and I didn't, Hassan. I hadn't, no. you know, there wasn't a book back then, but I hadn't read his articles or anything like that. But I was super aware of this man who'd created this company i was now working for this company and i was in like the ultimate position mm. for him to give me time and knowledge and yeah yeah i, I embraced that and i listened so yeah cool back to the fishing at yeah. that time yeah. early days tackle bait we it was the was the whole scope revolution nah, there, there was no, no there was no scope mate um back then um Basically, I came out of those three years at college being a carp angler. Yeah. We touched on this before. Um, my students were all carp anglers. I'd already come from that Terry Earn thing of wanting to be a carp angler. So I'm basically a carp angler in my head. Yeah. Um, I've come to Nash. I definitely have to be a carp angler now. Anytime I ever mention to Kev, oh, I might go perch fishing. What the fuck do you want to go perch fishing for? Yeah, he's he's not anti other species, but no. he's an out and out carp yeah, angler. Yeah, you know, yeah. he's done a bit of pike fishing, but so he he gets it now. He totally understands why I have this desire to fish for other species. But in, in the early stages of our relationship, he would just scratch his head. What the fuck do you want to catch two pound roach for? Why would any what for a dead bait? Like, yeah, he, he didn't. He's a diehard carp angler. He's a diehard carp yeah. angler. So I, I had to get that out of my system quickly. Like, yeah. I'm, if I'm going to make a success of this job, I need to work really hard at becoming a carp angler. And yeah, tackle became readily available. Bait became readily available. So I just became, I didn't become, that's the point of this. 
I was trying to become a carp angler and I was becoming very confused. I'd come from a confused era already, ready, yeah. where I'm looking at too many magazines and I want to spod and I want to use more rods and I want to do this and I want to join this lake. And I basically had forgotten lots of fundamental lessons from those really early years when dad and I could go to a venue and, again, in the least possible, fish very well and catch if not as much as everyone else, usually more than everyone else, you know. Mm. It was a successful area of my fishing. When I went and did those three years at college and then the sort of first three years at Nash, I'd say that sort of six-ish year period out of my entire life was the worst angling of my life. Really? Yeah, oh, 100% Hassan, you know, because my brain's in overload with, um, you know... <laughs> I've got every magazine in the world coming to my yeah. desk. Yeah, like yeah, every yeah. magazine. I'm looking, I'm scrutinising every magazine, looking for new trends or new tactics or what anglers are doing. Then I'm mixing with people that I never dreamt I'd be mixing with. The likes of Kevin, the likes of Basie, even other internal staff here, but more so the consultants, you mm. know, the team. Um, it was just... Yeah, <laughs> overload. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm fishing waters I shouldn't have been fishing back then, for example, the manor. And there was others. Um, Kev, you know, he, he was right. You know, you need to get these tickets. You need to get on a decent water. You, but it weren't the right time for me. Um, and yeah, I, everything kind of just imploded into me fishing as bad as I've ever done. You know, I, I, I couldn't fish any worse, really. I didn't understand the fundamentals mm. or, or I'd forgotten a lot of the fundamentals more so everything had become overcomplicated bait had become overcomplicated I remember like the, for the first time realising that Gary would roll specials yeah you know so I'd be like yeah oh, you knock us up like um, a squid with pineapple with a little bit of anchovy and a gal bless him yeah yeah okay. do it, yeah, yeah yeah what the fuck do I ask and I don't know the first yeah. thing about bait you know yeah. I'd already gone through uh, a big part of my fishing pre-nash just chopping and changing influenced yeah. by the magazine so I'd see this and then I'd chop or, or worst case I'd blank and I'd blame the bait you know it was always I'd get to the end of a session I'd go that bait shit I didn't catch anything not appreciating at the time that it was probably a whole host of other different reasons why I hadn't. It's always the bait's fault. We've always been, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Like, but I, and at Nash, it was the same. I'd, I'd use whatever bait, whiskey, Formula One, Mac One, and Amber Strawberry Scope. It's good. It, they were all there for me. Do you know what I mean? And I'd use one, and I might have have a, a bit of a result or catch a few, so I'd use it again. But then I'd blank, and then fuck that off, get on the next one. And, and I was constantly chopping and changing. Rigs were very much the same. Mm. If you look back in my rig boards, then I would have them all. Yeah, everything I'd seen in a magazine, I'd sit and yeah. tie, and and all of the really important lessons. Uh, they weren't there anymore and it was more I became very robotic and very textbook and I was trying to copy others and there was no it wasn't coming from you yeah man it was, was a lot of external influence yeah a lot of external influence a lot of confusion did you feel the pressure though trying to like I had to I had to catch yeah exactly because I had to come into Kev the next morning after an overnight or whatever and he'd be so interested how I got on Blanked again, Kev. Like, you know, so yeah, massive pressure. But yeah. not pressure as such. He wasn't like, you need to catch. Like, it was no, just, but I, it was embarrassment more than anything, I suppose. Yeah. And I was just out of my depth, Hassan. Yeah. I was out of my depth. Um, I wanted to be a carp angler. I just had too much at my disposal yeah. um, all of a sudden. So um, was there a moment where, like, there's like a moment of clarity or it sort of clicked in or you went back to basics or... So from there on in, it, it kind of got a bit better um, in that at some point I decided to hit a restart button. I think yeah. I'd had a cut, I'd done the manor, then I'd been to frying in and lasted about six sessions on there, but it was too busy. That and same sort of stuck in a swim, Basically, like I just, I, I was conscious at the time that if A, I was up against some shit or anglers and B... I was limited on my time. I wasn't a weekend angler at this point. I was like squeezing in overnighters or whatever. Mm. And I quickly realised that if you turned up at one of these venues, the stock were incredibly pressured. And if you didn't get on them, yeah. you go and blank in. So that frustrated me no end. Um, did Frining, did Star Lane, which is another quite renowned sort of syndicate. Kev cut Kev's teeth. Yeah. yeah, man. It's, you know, I wouldn't want to go on Star Lane, mate. After well, because of Kev. Like, of Kev like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I would give that a big swerve. But it, it was like, I caught all these venues with the exception of the manor. You know, I caught yeah. fish from Frying, I caught fish from the lane. 
but I never, it never really felt, I never really felt I was enjoying it or yeah, I was, yeah, it just wasn't the one for me. Um, I then at some point joined a, a syndicate called Culvert's Mere. At this point, I'm almost at my wits end, like mm. of like failing myself as a car pangler. So I've decided to join this particular syndicate, but strip it right back. So I'm only going to use this bait. Whatever happens, I'm going to stick on this bait. And this is really all Kev's influence and Gary's to a degree. You know, they always used to bang on to me about stock chopping and changing. It's all, as much down to your confidence as anything else. You need to understand that if you blank, there's other reasons why you've probably blanked. Mm. Stop blaming the bait, you know. Um, so I, I'd pick the bait now. The rigs, I remember going back onto mono hook links just with a, a hair coming straight off the eye. Yeah. So really, like it couldn't have been any more Basics, basic. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, I I quite enjoyed it and I was catching and I was going and I was pre-baiting and I was learning about where they'd go on a certain wind and... But then it got boring. It was like... What do you mean? I, I mean, like, it just didn't float my boat in terms of, right, yeah, I'll go down, I'll catch a few more, or I might blank. So, I don't know. It just wasn't ticking a big enough of a box for me. It just felt too boring. Yeah, you just know? going through the motions. Going through the motions, you know. Did you have a bit more freedom on there? Were you able to move around a bit more? Or was it yeah, similar? you did, because it didn't have, you know, it weren't the manor full of, like, yeah. 40 pounders and stuff. Um, there was a few big fish in there, and I caught some nice ones while I was there and stuff, but... Maybe it was the venue. It was a nut, and this is another thing to take note of with regards to Essex. There's an awful lot of irrigation reservoirs yeah, down here. Really and I know you've done your bit, fair bit of fishing down here, Aston, as well. They just never were really that appealing, you know. Um, so yeah, I did a bit on Culvert's Mere, and but there you're starting to catch. There's a little. I was always catching. I don't want to make it. Yeah, just, but nothing really clicked. It yeah. weren't like there was like by this point, Kev's taught me about pieces of the jigsaw. So I'm now conscious that there's all of these pieces mm. i suppose to put it into an analogy i was probably at a point now in my carp fishing all thanks to kev that i'd kind of started to understand a bit more about bait basically stop fucking chopping and changing <laughs> we make really good bait just pick one of those what were you on, you on squid or what, can you remember amber strawberry yeah. at the time you know which was a phenomenal bait but it was more about not chopping and changing every week He'd spent a lot of time with me talking about rigs and just the importance of the hook sharpening, the fact that, you know, he back in the day was using a jeweler to hand sharpen. Is it just how important? And it started to resonate with me. Yeah, you're right, Kev. You know, all my other fishing, I've been striking. My floater fishing, for example, I, I mentioned last time watching that fish take the bait. And but now all of a sudden I was definitely carp angling behind static rods. I'm relying entirely on the fish sucking the rig in potentially blowing it or moving it in tension the hook link if that hook isn't sharp enough if that hook isn't presentable in the first place that they can get access to it to, and it was just starting to click little bits of it and that was all down to him and his time and going back to the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle i was probably at a point where i could separate all the edges i'd yeah. got my corners i probably got a frame it was this middle bit i just couldn't complete the puzzle yet i yeah. really couldn't and yeah you know, I, I'm, I, what I've come to realise, Hassan, is you never complete that puzzle. No. Not in terms of carp fishing anyway. It just just gets a bit easier as, as time goes on and stuff. So, yeah. Um, what happened next? Fishing. I think the next big influence after Kev, you know, at this point we weren't really fishing together. Um, you weren't? No, not really. Okay. He was giving me time and helping me and talking to me. We did lots of rig tying together. I don't know if you've ever heard the story about the... You ever heard the combi? Uh, combi? Yeah, yeah. So I didn't really know what a combi rig... A combi rig to me was stripping, stripping <laughs> back the, the coating. coating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. like, nah, nah, you know... You Lazy know, man's combi. Proper, you know, a really good combi, Alan. You know, I used to use amnesia, or he was using amnesia at the time, and then he'd be joining a supple braid to it. And yeah, again, a whole man, I hadn't tied a back-to-back -back grinner before. I'd never needed to. The furthest, the only knot I've ever known and really only ever used is a blood knot. Mm. I, I used, that's everything for me. Yeah. And a hair rig. And a, so anyway, he showed me this back-to-back -back grinner and i never forget, man, this one day he's, um, he's pulling down on the hair or whatever. He's trying to tighten the air and he's put a size six fang X straight into his bottom lip. Oh. So we're sitting behind the desk and stuff. Um, yeah, between Sarah and I, we were um, told, the fucking hook out of my mouth. So we've had to remove that. How have you done that? Well, I learned again, another thing he taught me, he was like, you need to apply pressure either side, you know, really forcefully, and then you can just pop it out. But yeah, we just ripped it out. <gasps> you like, unhooked Kevin now. Yeah, and he, he always says, we both, you know, bearing in mind, he brought me in to do marketing. 
bearing in mind he was learning about the mark, talk about a missed opportunity because what we could have just grabbed a camera, got one shot, and it would have been a legit. And the blood was trickling down his chin, and so yeah, he was giving me all this time, but we weren't fishing together. So huge influence, but we're not actually mm. on the bank together. So it's like I'm getting the theory, yeah, in bundles, but I'm not getting the practical side of it. Around this time. We take Ollie out of the equation because he would have joined around this time as well. And I know yeah. that the, the next podcast, we're really going to talk about that. So, and he was a huge influence, mm. but taking him out of it, the next real big influences were Carl and Alex, which is what? bizarre to say such a thing when they were like really, I don't know, 10 years because old, how many youngsters. Years, how many years have you been in the so job? So we're, we're talking about, I've been in the job three years, for example, yeah. now, something like that, something like that. And uh, these two kids come on my radar in terms of it's my responsibility to try and find blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I get in touch with young Carl and Alex and we talk and stuff and we become friends and we do a deal, you know, where they start using some Nash and stuff. Around the same time is Alfie Russell. So yeah, I, was, wow. I was recommended Alfie from another local lad. He was like, you should really check this kid out, you know. Yeah. Um, and me and Alfie became great friends and how did you stumble across Carl Alex? I think probably the Anglers Mail or the Anglin Times okay. or, or something. It would have been one of those publications or it could have possibly been, I think it was probably Tim Knight at the Mail. Right. You know, yeah, because yeah. as you highlighted, Hassan, you had to have a, the best relationship possible with these editors. Tim was the editor at the time. And I'm going to give Tim the credit for probably giving me a tip off and saying, Al, oh, it's probably worth you having a chat with these two young boys. Um, anyway... The reason I make them mention them as being really quite influential is because they they made me remember what fishing used to be like. They made me remember what all of those adventures and lovely times were like. And I watched the, them fish, you know. They all three of them were as guilty as it as the other, you know. They would literally go fishing with the tip of their rod smashed off. They would go fishing with the bare minimum. Yeah. And it rem it reminded me how beautiful going angling could be instead of being burdened with a big barrow, potentially two trips, potentially all of this choice about which bait to use, which rig to use, which swim to go in, you know, all of these questions and stuff. I just watched these innocent mm. young men sending me in catch reports of fish that just made me go, fuck, wow. Now, and I knew how they'd done it. They'd done it with a free line, to, you know, they probably didn't change the line on their reels for two years. They hadn't, you know, yeah. with a bare hook, with nothing more than I used to do, with simple observation. But these weren't like, sometimes they were in the case of Kyle and Alex, but they weren't like, they were proper ones. You know, yeah. Alfie was catching proper fish. Even Kyle and Alex back then were catching proper fish and, and they went on to things like the Park Lake campaign where they're yeah. catching 40 pounders at such a young age. And if you watch that film, yeah. you'll see that the tackle was very basic. The, the way they did it, the way they accomplished those, those venues were very basic. And they were a really big moment for me in terms mm. of I need to really remember how it was for me, you know, how simple angling can be, how effective angling can be yeah. and not get so burdened down. Around the same time, Ditch started working for us and he introduced me to a venue, um, yeah, the, the Upper River Lee, somewhere I still to this day fish and it, it, it worked hand in hand with this, this tactic of just single rod, small amount of maggots yeah. or corn or oh, something, oh, yeah, sight yeah. fishing. Um and yeah, I basically, it was definitely around this point that work became number one priority. So right. I basically made a conscious decision that look, I let the anglers, the proper carp anglers, be the proper carp anglers. I'm going to focus on the job. And if I get the opportunity to treat myself, because I work really hard, to go angling, I'm just going to go fishing. Yeah. You know, and I probably at this point picked up the, the multi-species fishing again. Yeah. Probably a bit, not to Kev's dislike in that, but you know, if you've, you know, three times, three times. If it's a Sunday and I want to go perch fishing, I'm going to go perch fishing, you Again, know. Again, you've sort of stripped away all the clutter. It's the pure yeah. essence of fishing, yeah. isn't it? And it, it was um, it was really nice, Hassan. Mm. It was really nice. I didn't feel that they, they, I didn't feel there was actually any pressure for me to go and catch 40 pounders because that's what our sponsored anglers did and, and stuff like that. And yeah, I was going to focus on the job. Let the big boys, the proper anglers do the, the, 
the marketing, yeah. the, yeah. the catching of these big carp. And I'm going to go and at the odd opportunity where I did get the chance to fish, just enjoy myself. So, so who did you have on the proper anglers team at the time? Back then, I've had them all, and I? Yeah, you I know I have. Been nah, there's been loads. I can't remember, mate. But back then, like, could have been Shelley. Uh, could have been Jerry Ammon, Dave Levy, yeah. uh, Sharpie. Crowy as well, isn't Crowy. It? They've all been and gone yeah. and, and stuff over the years. Um, and they've all played a, a, a role. And I'm yeah. forever grateful for everything that anyone's ever done in their time at Nash. Um, but yeah. What was it? Were you responsible for sort of, obviously, the, the media that they're producing, if you like? Yeah. You're responsible for, to some extent in how you use that. But yeah. day to day sort of liaising with them? Were yeah, you quite so I, yeah. As, as best as I could yeah. you know when you know you've got to think you're juggling well I was juggling a lot of balls and yeah it was my responsibility to make sure they were doing their bit um, assisting them if I could in terms of they'd need an order sent out you know because we're not you know we're not this big massive corporate back then it was like yeah. I'll be writing down they'd be on one phone I'll be writing down they want this and then, and then I'd have to transfer that to Tico it was all very long winded process to get yeah. to but yeah it was my responsibility to, to do my best anyway to at least look after those lads that were sponsors and associated with the brand and those lads at the time like good with you Any- of course everyone was good as gold yeah. you know if I think back even like I'd already been fishing the choddy since those college years, basically yeah. the estate lake I mentioned, it was really silty, Hassam, and the only rig that really lent itself to to present effectively, because we're talking God knows how many years of silt, was the choddy. So I'd seen this choddy in the magazines and stuff, and but I fished it really badly, and my take my, my take rate was very high. Mm. My land rate was extremely low. You know, I was dropping most of the fish I was hooking and stuff. And it was Jim in the office. You know, he sat me down and he tied the choddy and explained the mechanics behind it and, and then Jerry tagged onto that months later or whatever showed me a different way to tie the bristle filament to the, the swivel and stuff and yeah you know I've been so lucky to have yeah. the inf- the influences I've had over the years and to be fair mate to this day you know I've caught a good few fish on a choddy yeah. that it hasn't changed no it hasn't changed the no. only I don't use uh, like the floss or the ring anymore. I've got a bait screw, but the actual way I tie it is exactly the same as 13, 12, 13 years ago when Jim and, and Jerry invested just a little bit of time to to show me how they do it. Already proficient choddy anglers, and yeah. I haven't changed it since. And yeah. but again, there's quite like a theme, like your relationship with Kev, quite sort of yeah, absorbing like all the information that's being chucked at you, really, mate, yeah. and taking what is relevant to whatever's going to benefit you. Yeah. Have to, positive. have to, yeah, just yeah. listened a lot and what other key things did Kev teach me and, and tell me, I, yeah, I could literally talk for hours just about that, but big ones were, he used to explain that, and it's so logical, and I've since gone on to talk to thousands of people about, you know, exactly the same message, that wherever you're fishing, it don't matter whether it's a, a river, a lake, a, a canal, whatever it is, Kev always used to say to me, just treat it like your house, you know, and in your house, there'll be areas where you spend a phenomenal amount of time, for example, maybe the living room or your bedroom, um, and there'll be areas of your house where you spend very little time, you know, the the hallways, maybe the garage, maybe Mm. the bathroom or whatever, and he always said to me, you know, from, from a young age or from many years ago, just think of it like that, Al. The quicker when you're on that water, you can ascertain where do those fish want to spend a lot of their time and where are they spending little amounts of time? When you revisit that venue or even on a particular session, you can start just deleting areas of the water, stop wasting time in those, focus your effort and your energy, you know, into those areas. That was really critical, Hassan. Yeah. Just a simple analogy like that, that, you know, and it made, and I've never forgot it. No. Quickly, right, they don't like it there. They keep going over there, right, the, that's, you know, that's there. Yeah. yeah, you know, things like that and stuff. Um, it's proper, like, it's such a fertile ground. That you've got all those anglers who yeah. are, like, top of the tree. You've got a young, receptive sort of lad forging his career, and then you've got Kev at the helm of it all, mate. Yeah. Like, in terms of, like, influences and things oh, aligning. You're never going to get better. That's an yeah. absolute result, isn't it? Yeah. We talked at the very start, you were you were in the lodge. So I'm guessing, sort of three years in, you're not still in the lodge, No, mate. so eight months-ish, Chloe moved down here, and we got right. a place together and stuff. And, yeah, that she quickly clocked on that I was having the time of my <laughs> life. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so she moved down. Yeah, so Chloe's here. She joined Nash... 
I'm going to say like two or three years after me. Okay. And that was really reluctantly on my part, like really, really? reluctantly. Because we'd worked together previously. Yeah. yeah. She was the bar manager. This is for the wedding specifically. We'd put on very elaborate, beautiful weddings on this estate. And um, I was the wedding function manager. She was the bar manager. My role and responsibility was not as stressful as hers. I yeah. just had to make sure that bride and groom were having the best night of their life. Champagne, plenty of shots, make sure everyone's happy dancing. Too easy. And she had the stress of running a, a you know, a bar's like a wedding. It's carnage, you know, and it, it we, things would great, you know, mm. there'd be me swanning around in a, in a suit, giving it the big and making sure everyone's happy and poor Chloe would be grafting, you know, with a team of bar yeah. staff. So we know, we managed to maintain it and work together and do it. But it, I always thought after that, nah, that it, keep the things separate, have a relationship, yeah. keep work separate and that. So Kev quite quickly got on with Chloe. He's very fond of her. What was Chloe's first role then? What was she? What did she? So he 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 basically was putting the not putting the pressure on, but a number of times he was like, "Look, Al, she." I think when she moved down here, she ended up sort of managing a, a local pub, the Bull, and she was worked just to, yeah, yeah, you know, a bit of contribution towards rent and stuff. Um, so he was like, "Why? Why? We've got opportunities here. She's a bright girl. Why don't no, no?" And I was really stubborn about it. Really put my foot down and. In the end, he kind of, I wouldn't say convinced me, but the, the case or the argument was strong enough for me to go, okay, we'll try it, you know. Yeah. So she was brought in to work um, in, in UK sales. And, yeah, she did that right the way through until wow. uh, until we had children and stuff. What so, was that like for you then? Because that is quite a change. Like, lads, you've had your party time. It might have been abruptly ended because she's found out. But yeah. then your missus has come down. You're renting, you're sort of trying to find your feet in that regard, but also she's working with you. So she wasn't. I think that was the point Kev oh, was right. always trying to make, you know, at my role and her role, there was very little involvement okay. together, you know what I mean? So I just kind of, yeah, blanked out the fact that we were together and she was just a, an employee like I was an employee. And if I needed to communicate with her on something, we would communicate. And it, it wasn't the same as the the weddings and stuff mm. where you really, you're, you go hand in hand, but my role, it wasn't easier. I just swanned around a bit more, like, yeah. because that's what it involved kind yeah. of thing. But anyway, so yeah, she she worked at Nash and there was, it, it really was a great thing, you know. And, that, and that's Kev all over. Yeah. That, that just about sums Kev up in terms of he will do anything and yeah. everything to try and make others' lives better and easier because he's in a position where he can. Mm. You know, he, he really made our lives better in that respect. So much so, and I think I've said this on other interviews and stuff, he can take the credit to a degree for us being together still and yeah. having children. I don't know if you've ever heard this, you know. I I was so focused on Nash and work, she also could have gone places. Into, yeah, of course. I wanted her to be career driven to the level I was I was piling a lot of pressure on her in this respect um all she wanted was a family I did want a family just not now yeah. too many parties to go to Chloe too much work to do too much fishing to do can we just hold off and hold off? and yeah there was times when I was thinking to myself and she probably thought the same you know is this going to yeah. work long term are we going to be together till we die are we going to actually have a family and it was a it was really Kev telling me the importance of leave her alone, Alan. What if, Alan, all she wants is a beautiful family? What mm. if she doesn't want to be career driven? What if she doesn't want a big salary? What if she, and I'd never ever thought of it like that. I've always thought, well, no, if that surely everyone wants that. Yeah, surely like, everyone, yeah, yeah. everyone wants the best out of their yeah. life. Everyone wants a bigger house or a, a nicer car or a better. Not Chloe. No. She don't. <laughs> she just wants a beautiful family and yeah. she loves nothing more than having Sunday rose to the family. That is Chloe's perfect week, yeah, you know. So um, he can definitely take the credit for have given me a big kick up, kick up the arse there and a big life lesson in terms of, yeah. So in that first year, you said that you've obviously moved, you've made that commitment, you're all here, and you said that work was your main focus rather than you fishing. Mm -hmm. How did your role sort of, or how did you adapt within that role over that time? How do you mean, mate? So more like... We're going back to year one we here. Go, right? Well, we're going back to that sort of first three years that we're talking yeah. about. How did... 
like what you did and how you sort of split your time, if you like. How mm. did that evolve? Because I'd imagine initially you're finding your feet. Okay, so it, it actually, <laughs> it got even more mental. So I've come in to do marketing um, quite quickly within a couple of years. Kev's noticed another, I hate saying it because it seems so big, another skill set in me. Mm. <coughs> and that is, I've got an eye for detail. I learned this a long time ago. It burns me, these boys here now that I work with and that. They like, I'm saying this to everyone because I think it's a really important part of yeah. life that a lot of people don't, it, they don't quite get it. They do a job. I'm going to take the washing up as an example. Yeah. Yeah, so they know they're going to get a bollocking if the kitchen ain't clean, yeah. i.e. all the plates are washed up and put back away again. So they do that, and then all they've got to do to complete the job is take a scourer and just clean the side down, but they don't. It's like, well, I've done the washing up, that's it. And I always think, but if you just, like, it would be 100% complete, and I see this a lot with people. They, yeah. they do a job to the, not the bare minimum necessarily, but to the minimum but they never quite finish, finish it. it. Yeah, and I've always prided myself maybe going back, especially to when I had this little gardening thing going. The reason I was getting the massive repeat trade and it just snowballed is because I made sure once I'd cut the grass, I swept up. Mm. If I cut someone's edge, I swept up. So you basically the owner of the property would come back out and go, wow. They mega. couldn't, mega. Yeah. And, and this was a big thing for me, a big thing for the success of that. They, they, it just leaves it perfect. It looks brilliant at the end of it. And I see so many people do a job, but they don't quite. Anyway, he noticed this in me. And very quickly, I was being pulled into more product development meetings and more opinion. What's your opinion on this? And yeah, basically, after about year three, I'm now on a plane to China. Yeah. I'm going over there with Gary and Kev, or sometimes just Kev, sometimes with Gary. And yeah, my role quickly became split between the marketing and the product development. Mm, um, that's massive, though. Massive. So how and how exciting though? I can sit here and go, you oh, you wouldn't believe how stressful I get and how much work. But when I reflect back on the opportunities I've had yeah. over the last fourteen years to have done the things I've done and go the places I've gone and met the people, I, oh, you just, I feel so lucky. Not lucky because you make your own luck, don't yeah, you? Yeah, of course you do. So privileged and blessed to have been given opportunities and so yeah i'm on planes to china i'm going what's to that like support. what's the what's hey, the chiny china the, experience the like, first mate? trip i've kept all the photos like god knows why but the first time i went there i photographed everything yeah can you imagine like it's literally everything i've never been on a long haul flight before really the first i've been was ibiza so really? yeah so i'm now on a plane to china with Basie. And uh, he's just hilarious, he is. So anyway, I'm pho every meal I ate, I photographed it, every place, everything was getting... Now, it's like, it's like, yeah. you know, it's just <laughs> common to me now. I've been yeah. so many times, but yeah, so I, I realised that I had, there was value I could add there. Um, not because of my wealth of product development, not because I've been an engineer, not because I think even to this day now, because I like to just make sure it's finished like like the camo for example thing, things mm. like that i will sit with designers and i will not come off that computer until i am complete i won't take uh it's okay oh that'll do that's all right now yeah i will keep i'm having it at the moment of a particular garment where it's ruffling a little bit too much right i'm not happy i won't i, I won't go nah, yeah, I, no. in my head it, it ain't right until it's absolutely right and it, and the same goes for everything we do you know i'm so that was that's the only skill set i've really got in terms of the development but it, it kev obviously thinks it's important so um and yeah i've done it ever since heavily involved in in the product development ever since and i've learned a lot you know I, i'm s still anything but an engineer and i still yeah. struggle with understanding the processes and and stuff like that but the more you do something, the, the better you get. And I've improved a lot over the years. Yeah. I've learned a lot over the years. And What was general... Because obviously, I mean, you've always been relatively on a, on a level with regards to Kev. He's always been good with you. You've always had a close relationship from day one in terms yeah. of investing time. But then you're sort of brought up to product development, which is a little bit different to marketing. Because mm -hmm. by the sounds of it, marketing... You've shot ideas around you, both learning, but product development. Kev's come from years of development. He's on a don. Rigs. He's an absolute. Yeah, he's a don. Like, and um, then you took Basie in as well. So you so sort of quite quickly, Basie stepped back from it. Okay. 
Um, and then it was kind of just down to, to Kev and I. Um, Basie went and focused more in the bait factory. Bait sales were growing rapidly and stuff. Uh, don't get me wrong, I did work on development with Basie for two or three years, mm. but it, it, in the latter years, no. It was no different, Hassan. He, really? just, he just taught me everything and told me all the stories and all the f- mistakes he made, he told me, so he could try to get me not to make them again. And, you know, one of the first ones, of pro- the, one of the, the golden rule of product development, in my opinion, is you don't develop product for yourself. Mm. You know, you have to understand the market. What does the market require? And, you know, Mikey, I love him, mate. Yeah. But it took him a little while to get that. It's it's a, it's a guilty pleasure, isn't it? Oh, I can develop things now. I'm going to develop what I need. Well, it's you start doing that, you're on the back foot already. It's yeah. a disaster. So, no, Kev taught me everything about it, you know. What was... Was there much difference with regards to obviously you're quite free and open anyway as a pair because you spend so much time together but what was it like when you weren't necessarily like working in terms of your relationship did you like at this point you're fishing together you sort of i don't know going out for meals together was there some downtime or, or anything like that yeah so at some point in amongst all this year four i don't know we, we started fishing together yeah um which was some of my fondest memories um yeah, so we, it all started off really, there would have been some church lake and cop sessions. I should point that out, you know, anyone watching this, you've probably heard of the church and the cop, we've referenced it already. Mm. Where we work, we are very blessed to have water, water on site, number of lakes and stuff. Um, Kev's created more, it is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, the surroundings, what's been created, the stock, etc. My first ever church lake session, it's worth just mentioning this quickly, Kev, eventually said reedy alan go on then go on you've worked hard go and have a weekend and i remember i had to take him to the airport this is kev and his partner at the time on the saturday morning and it was like a 4 30 i'd get him from the house to go to the airport so we started on the friday evening after work and by the saturday morning when i had to reel the rods in at four or whatever to go and get him i'd already had a 48 common a 30 a 44 Lever, after, and I remember just the smile yeah. on my face. Like, really, had had a load of biggins as well. And I kind of walked, I didn't walk, I skipped down to him. Mm. Like, and he's like, How'd you get on that? It just blew my mind, Hassan. Yeah. And it's, it's a story that I'll often tell, especially the younger anglers, because I even had it the other day. One of the, the if you had to say top three questions in carp fishing, I'd say number one is, What's your PB? What's your PV? What's your PV, yeah, mate? What's yeah, your PV, yeah. Alan? And for me, we touched on it last time, it was in a fundamental part of my angling journey. Mm. I wanted to get my first double. I really want my first 20, my first 30. But they were so hard earned. Mm. Like, we're talking hundreds of carp, thousands maybe between those things, hundreds of sessions. It, there was no quick fix for me back then. Yeah. So having the opportunity to fish on the church lake and just obliterate PBs in less than 12 hours... I very quickly realised this this place ain't real. No, this ain't real life. This isn't. It, it was fishing. I had caught them. I had put my rig in the water and selected it and chose my bait. I'd done every it, what, and I'd caught it, but it weren't real. No, you know. And I always tell people nowadays that a PB is deemed as your personal best, which I think is is the wrong term for it. You know, personal best is what it personally means to you. Now, it could well be that it's the biggest, fattest carp you've caught, but I often look at it like that, you know. If an angler, in this instance me, gets the opportunity to fish a lake like the church that is three, four acres in size and full, full (laughs) of massive carp, if I use a remotely good rig and a remotely good bait and I put it in a remotely good place, odds are on I'm going to catch big carp and... People don't think that. They think that if someone's got a big PB, it's 60 pounds or 70 pounds or 80 pounds, they immediately presume that's like a benchmark or that's an achievement. Or mm. And, and oh, it's really hard to explain. My brother always says to me, he's like, bro, you're actually pretty shit, aren't you? Like, you've got no trophies. <laughs> like, you've got no medals. Where's your medals, bruv? Like, where's your medals? I'm like, mate, you don't work like that in fishing. No. You know, that isn't how you met. Yeah, but come on, bruv. Like, people have got medals and you haven't got any. Like, And he's right. You know, I haven't got any trophies or medals, but... Yeah, I think people get too caught up in breaking a personal best. I did. 
but it seemed like the right thing to do there. It seemed like a good measure of success. Yeah. Nowadays, the carp fishing boom, they're so accessible. And if you can just get onto a venue full of big carp, you know, odds are on you're going to catch loads of big carp. So, yeah, that was the church access. And so, back to the question, Kev and I would have done a bit of fishing on the church and mm. the cops together. And then a water in the local area, um, I basically got a ticket for it. Kev will tell the story better than, than me, but I very shrewdly offered a lad a job here, which enabled me to get a ticket. <laughs> kind of, <laughs> kind of. Go. I might be tad exaggerating that, but we needed a person. We needed an employee. I knew this lad. We gave him a job. I gave him a job. That then opened a door for me to be able to, to get a ticket for this particular war. But it was never like... If I give you this job, you've got, it weren't like that. Like it weren't sign like on that. this contract. No, yeah, yeah, and I get it. It weren't like that. Anyway, so I'm now joining this ticket. Well, I'm kind of unbeknown to me. Kev spent his life trying to get this ticket, and really? yeah, the door's always been shut. It's Kevin Nash, you know. Oh, yeah. Um. Anyway, I've now got a ticket. He's a little bit annoyed about this, and we end up going for a meeting in a pub. So it's Kevin and myself. I'm a ticket holder. He is them, and it's the two owners of the the club or the two chairmans of the club, they control three waters on this sort of little portfolio of, of ticket. And uh, long story short, few points later, Kev's now got a ticket. We've yes. managed to list, lift a lifelong publicity ban so we can now film there. We all got on like a house on How fire. many beers did you have? With Not that many, mate. to be fair. It weren't that many. It was just like a couple. It was just a lovely evening and they chatted a lot about the history and history mm. of the local area. And so, yeah, that was Kevin and I's first proper sort of sessions, regular sessions together. We did a couple of winters there. And I mean winter fishing, none of this, like, like Ollie goes on about it now all the time. Winter, that's not winter. You know, we fished through the winter. Yeah. And again, it just oozed out of him. He taught me so much. I remember one winter we devoted numerous night sessions we'd get the rods out and stuff but then it would be like he'd be trying to explain the importance of indication to me and running rig setups and how this was right around the era we first started developing the bite alarm how bite alarms had become screamer detectors and they weren't registering bites as such and that's when he taught me about the blowout tube rig and you know how it can blow back on the shank and identify if you've been done and mm. i'm just I'm drinking, learning, drink, learning, yeah. learning. But yeah, it's kind of going in now. It's making sense now. Of you know, those some of those other, and that jigsaw now is starting to really start to yeah. to take a bit more shape and stuff. Uh, from there, where did Kevin and I fish together after that? I feel I'm going to miss somewhere. We might have gone to the pit. This is the pit of Molden, but I, again, I won't go into a massive amount of detail. But we had two three maybe we had a a good chunk of time together there are oh, such fond memories that is where scope was conceived that is where talk us through that then because that is i, I mean, think i'll leave it for him but, but basically no. what what was happening was we were doing like minimum 24 sometimes 48 hours every week religiously yeah. um We'd both do the hours at the weekend or we'd work the lot so we would basically free up this time that we could fish together he was carrying on teaching me how to be a carp angler, yeah. you know, and, and he did on that venue as well um, from, from start to finish. Neither of us had seen the water and we went through the process of... But what happened there is we, we used to work as well. So once the rods were out, once we've had, a, had our first coffee of the morning, out would come the work. And, yeah, um, yeah we really got into some serious development over there, not just scope, but other things as well. Um I just remember the sessions intently trying to watch the water and the spreadsheet yeah. and the water and the spreadsheet and the water and then you get a bite and it was really disruptive but yeah. it wasn't because it was golden time together yeah. out of the office no phones ringing yeah. in the right environment to develop fishing tackle on the bank you know and that's how his fertile mind worked and that there was an issue with our long rods because it was definitely we weren't allowed to fish there we were living on this little island poaching and stuff and it was just a ball like with these 12 footers you know in six foot rod skins and that is where the the concept of, of scope come from that's mad yeah which is mad i was only speaking to uh the boys in marketing about it last week i said can you imagine like me and him on this little island yeah you had to walk through the lake through reeds to get to it and then no one else can get there unless you had a set of chesties on so we're now on this little, our own little island with the rods out, catching them, doing this work. One day he turns around and says, got this fucking good idea out. At least it is for me. What do you think? I'm going to retract the butt of a short rod. I'm going, that's amazing. And then we launched it like 
12 months, 18 months later, once we did the samples, once him and I tested it, like we launched it, and pretty much the whole trade just laughed at us. Has had like really well, yeah, I think I can vaguely remember yeah. it, but it was it was a while ago, it wasn't though. it wasn't received with immense open arms. The shops weren't mm. flooding to place massive orders, there might have been the odd angler who was like yeah i can see what they're saying here but it was very revolutionary in terms of you know mm. the benchmark had been set for carp rods they were 12 foot or if you wanted to go that little bit further you'd get 13 foot now i just know it felt at the time anyway people were laughing going look at these lot they're bringing nine foot rods out with yeah. that telescopic element as the well telescopic elements the one do you know what i mean it? you could that it's a stigma word telescopic it is. remember those ones shit. you used to get for the holiday where you used to like you know. these just breaking off and yeah, we, we, he stuck to what he believed. Mm. I believed in him and I believed in the concept and we pushed it through, as did lots of other people eventually get behind it and stuff and it became, became pretty big. Massive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, massive, massive. Did you have any sort of, over that time, did you have any sort of complete shockers or anything that stands out in your memory in those formative years? With him, any product ideas, any particular instances of like marketing, which you've you've obviously not been successful at, because by the sounds of it, like you just got stuck in and started smashing stuff from the get go. Do you know what I mean? None like taking three students in a car and taking. Nah, that's that was like catastrophic. Yeah, no, I can't think of any like that. Hassan, did I make loads of mistakes? Yes. Did Kev make mistakes? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Did we? Look at where we went wrong. Act on that. Yes. So, no, I can't honestly sit here and go, at this point, I cost the company this much money because mm. of an error I made. Um, no, not really. Yeah. Things like one Christmas, because, you know, we're spending every day together. If I'm in England or he's in England, we are together, working, talking, communicating, having dinner together, like everything. I remember one Christmas... We both decided to create the Peg One range. Right. Which, you know, you could sit there and go, well, that was a bit of a disaster, but it weren't. You know, we just didn't give it long enough. So, yeah, there's been product lines or routes we've gone down together and thought this is the right thing to do and it hasn't quite mm. worked out. But you you can't get them all right all no. the time and stuff. No, I can I can sit here now. I wish you could ask Kev this because he might think differently, but no, I can't think of anything truly disastrous um, in, in that respect. And that's probably because him guiding me and listening and because he probably made the mistakes himself already and he's he, he's really passionate about that in terms of look if there's one thing you use me for use me so i can tell you where i fucked up mm. so you don't go and do the same mistake again kind of thing so that's always been there um and nah, no, no real issues no like real i don't know fallouts or or anything whereby you you really disagreed and, and it's become at all sour because like yeah. I've read some of the articles that people have published and himself where he's where he's lost his head. We were talking in the last pod I did with him where he's just been real fiery and it's and it's ended a bit abruptly, shall we say. Yeah. None of that? Yeah, he has. He's lost his head with me. Yeah. Like he shouted at me. He's made me sad. He's made me think, what am I doing? Should I knock this on the head? Is this not for me? But hand on art, mm. in every single instance where that's occurred, I've listened to what he said looked at the decisions I'd made or my own actions and not all the time. I don't want to make him sound like he's a perfect because he's not perfect. Yeah. But the bulk of the time I've gone, he's fucking right. He's fucking right. And I need to sort myself out. I need to work harder. I need to do this better. I need to manage better. I need to, whatever it is. You know, he once took us all away. I say all of us. He took, he took the key members of younger staff away. So it was myself, his son, Lee, who joined. Mm. Lee is like an integral part of Nash. Massively important. Not an angler, so people don't have a clue who he is. But So me, Lee, Matt Nipples, Reedy and Chloe. He took the five of us away. She was looking after UK sales now. Yeah, Matt was UK sales key accounts manager. Reedy was kind of taking on more of the marketing from me. And okay. Lee was coming in, he was on an accounting course, like a degree and stuff, and we he was basically trying to sh gear up for the next generation of Nash Tackle. So he took us all away. Again, I put this in printing carpology. 
Basically, we got bollocks for a week in Cyprus. Mm. Long and short of it, we got nice. absolutely twatted, mate. Like it was brilliant <laughs> time of our lives. Yeah, but there was a couple of points where he he, he reined us in, mm. sat down, and we talked business. And I was only talking to him about it the other day that that sticks with me. You know, there was certain things. You know, the importance of understanding urgency. If a supplier needs a bit of information and I don't get that bit of information to them and it's potentially delaying the stock coming in, mm. I'm holding the whole business back, you know, or if a report needs to be generated on a sample and I don't, urgency, 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 focus, you know, it, it, there's no point in daydreaming off into a, or having conversations much longer than they need to be, you know, be polite with people, but be concise in, in what you're trying to do and do. Get the job done in hand, you know, and then move on to the next one. Don't start waffling or like, he always used to say, like, if I ever started, like, becoming a bit excited or talk, he'd say, Alan, I don't want to fucking eat a blight and just tell me. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right, you know, when you're trying yeah. to run a business, yeah. you know, great, if we're after work, we can do story time then. Yeah. Run. But now, just fucking, I need the answers, you know, so don't give me an eating a blight and focus prioritizing mm. you know i look at my desk even today it's covered in you know you've seen it's covered in post-it notes it's, so i come in every morning right what did, needs to be done now today prioritizing and yeah those things have stuck with mm. me so no we've never really fallen out the other thing he is good at is he's good at giving something a bollocking and moving on you know, he doesn't hold grudges, or not in my experience anyway. You yeah. know, if you've been an idiot, if you've done something wrong, you're going to get your bollock in, and then he's going to move on, you know, and I've always respected him for that. Um, nah. Uh, yeah. Nice, mate. Yeah. You can see that now. You're still dog walks in the morning. 100%. Grudges, it, it's a, it's 100%. A, yeah, it's almost like a father-son relationship, mate. Um, in terms of you or yourself, so this time when we're leading up into you becoming sort of more product development, going to China and, and this whole adjustment. How do you think you've changed within the role over this course of years? Because obviously it's an unknown quantity at the start. It's changed a lot. You as an individual, the party scene, is it still there? It's never going to go away, I don't think. No? no, it's just, you know, instead of going lots, I just go a few times a year. Yeah. I have to. Yeah, I have to because for around 10 years, let's say, there, thereabouts, haven't really fished for myself. Mm. I've done a lot of fishing and I'm forever grateful that I've got a job that allows me to angle as part of my job. But my personal angling, it doesn't really exist to a degree. Mm. Um, everything's got an agenda. Everything's got a potential article. Everything's got a potential Insta story. Everything's got a film. So my only, my only big treat is to maintain that socializing element of party and i don't go to the pub of a weekend or anything like that just once in a while i have a blowout with everyone yeah loads of us go out and we have a big party we go to a festival or we do whatever so that's i think that's important for me for my sanity because otherwise i would just work yeah you know? yeah, um, yeah yeah uh, because i, I'm, I don't feel i'm fishing for myself, if that makes sense. I don't feel I'm going, to, especially now, Jesus, with social media, everything's got to be recorded, everything's got to be. Yeah. So no, that's that's still important. Um, has it changed? Yes, because Nash is so big now. Mm. We've got the most phenomenal team of, of people working for us. So whereas, you know, I, I always use the show thing as an, uh, an example. For years, I used to be at the forefront of the shows. I would design the stand. I would liaise with the show organiser. Wow. I would plan it. I would load the vans from here. I would drive the vans halfway across Europe. I would get there. I would be with a small crack team. We would build the stand. We wouldn't go to sleep. We would then stand on the stand. Big smiles. We're Nash Tackle. Look at our amazing product. And then I'd pack it all down, drive it all back to England, do my day job in or my week job in a few days and then go and do it again. So that was uh, life. It was carnage. But to Absolutely be fair, carnage. Like, and I can say this on it. <laughs> you, it might be now that there is the same amount of work. It's just different things. Yeah, mate, yeah. yeah. The, the it's workload always ha carnage. Honestly, the workload hasn't, it hasn't eased at all. No. But what has eased is instead of me now loading a show van and don't do any of it. I literally yeah. turn up on a Saturday morning, flying on an aeroplane, big smile still, loads of love for for the people that come to see us and talk about our products and stuff. 
well, I've got a fantastic show team that do all mm. that, you know, and that's the difference now, Hassa, and it's just got so big. But yeah, still work as hard. It's just yeah. slightly different. And I'm still heavily involved in the marketing, discussing with brilliant managers, Dan Yeomans, Alfie Rus uh, Willingale, uh, Henry, yeah. um, and, and all the people in Europe, Colin, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and all the guys out in Europe. And then the development, there's Mikey, there's Kev still, we've got specialised CAD engineers and... It's just a different level. It, yeah. I'm putting my time into different ways and stuff. Yeah, yeah, of course. In that in that first four year period, obviously, the industry's changed. There's been a there's been a boom in carp fishing. There's also a change in media, which we'll talk about with regards to social media creeping in and magazines maybe phasing out. But did you ever have any other companies approach you? Did you ever get tempted <coughs> to take other roles? Because obviously, Nash has obviously scaled up. Your involvement's in line with all that as well as the times but there's nothing like that has ever come in the, uh, preston spoke to me once okay not interested no no and other than that no did you ever feel that if i think i was always i think lots of people have asked me indirect questions yeah. that might have been trying to sound out a decision but i've been very straight down the line no, not interested and that goes back to a lifelong socialising scene of friends where everything revolved around loyalty. Yeah. You know, if you remember in the last podcast, I was put in that really, not through anyone's fault, but I was put in that really awkward position. I had this fantastic group of friends at school the whole year, you know, I just got on with everyone. And then I had this fishing group of friends and over one stupid drunken incident mm. after a night, I had to make a call on that. And it, I hated it. I hate it to this day. that I'm, yeah. so those, A lot of those people, most, I've never spoke to those people ever again after that one night. So I've always been loyal. Mm. It's always been about loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. And growing up, all of my friends, it's been about loyalty. And even more so with Kev, if someone's going to give you all the time and all the, the, the love and the attention and the support and guidance that he has they can offer me what they want or people could have proposed what they want. I couldn't have done it. Mm. Couldn't have done it. Yeah. Like, um, so no. Yeah, I could take that. Um, and this period of time again, you, Chloe, are the kids here yet? No? No. So what happened after that? Um, Kevin and I went to um, La Gomera. Yes. Oh. One of the highlights of my fishing life. That was a, a big adventure for us. Um, again, it's something we'd probably touch on it around, yeah campfire or whatever uh, another story to tell at a different time because it, it was beautiful it was a fantastic moment mm. chloe and i were doing things like we were we went on a trip to grand canaria kind of in kev's footsteps um, went out to grand canaria had a fantastic trip fishing fishing yeah, yeah. so nice. we went uh, and fished and stuff we caught some really nice fish had them to like nearly mid 40s which wow. was sheer massive carp massive didn't have loads but we caught consistently each day and, and did uh, did manage a real big and Fundamental lesson, strength and liability. That's when it really hit home to me. You know, I'm fishing with a little toy dinghy, basically with Shimano long cast. As far as that, you know, I'm, 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 I'm empty in a spool. Do you mm. know what I mean? Going to great distances. And uh, you look at the, the, the banks and stuff there, the stone and that. Savage. It, it, yeah, strength and reliability. I've never forgot it. Don't use gear that looks good or it's fancy or it's got these swiveling bits in it. If you're going to look something that's going to mean something to you, do not let any element of your tackle let you down. Again, something Kev banged in, into me. So that was a great trip. Where else did I go with Chloe? We had a really cool trip to Austria, um, fishing various different kinds of lakes. Ended up on an island for a few days, living off an island. He loves living off an island. I do love an know? island. Learned about the, the use of underwater cameras. This is like, God, more than a decade ago. Um, learned, I fished another venue, uh, one of the carp centre lakes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Um, learn the valuable valuable lesson of um fishing very short hook links in silt when they're bloodworm feeding you know get the bait down into the silt and also and this is you know, a lot of people i don't think appreciate this how valuable a rubbing stick can be on a venue ended up catching the biggest fish in, in the lake see a fish bang this stick a couple of times fished a single to it and ended up catching a, a fish Where called is this? this was in the carp center lake as well really? this is all in one sort of week sort of session um we also fished uh, another venue chloe and i this is right in the infancy of the rise of pellet yeah we've turned up there and um it was a very hot day um the lad i was with hansy still a good friend to this day 
he was um, explaining, you know, he's fishing a lot of soft paste, like the match anglers, and empty in the place. And he was like, this is the tactic on here. They've kind of seen it all, the heavily pressured venue. And um, I said, like, I'm going to try on the top. He's like, nah, mate, they've never been fished for with a floater before. So we had a sack, like a big sack, and um, me and Close started feeding it. And for hours, there was no reaction. Mm. You know, they weren't on the top. You couldn't see these black shapes. It was one of those days when I said it was almost too hot for yeah. them to sunbathe because yeah, yeah. it was too hot. Yeah. They were under the shade and stuff. And we carried on persevering and persevering. Well, by sort of one, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, no exaggeration, every fucker in that lake was taking riser pellet. We had the whole, everyone else around the lake tacked up and went home. Yeah, yeah. She caught the biggest fish in the lake. How uh, big was that? Oh, I can't remember, like upper 30. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a really cool trip. Where else have we been, Chloe? Kempish Canal, we did that. Oh, cool. Again, that was kind of a bit of a, a bucket list thing. And at this point, you know, because of all the stuff I've learned, I went over there, everyone told me, rock hard, rock hard, rock hard. And um, we did three days, three days, three nights, and I caught three carp. And they were all on my terms. Mm. You know, it, I tried going into going, um, going sections. I tried going into going pegs. I, I was had influence or, or good people right. on the ground over there. They're going, yeah, try here, try here. And it all, in the end, it boiled down to, I was going to blank. I wasn't going to catch anything. So I've, I've had one on a bit of bread, I've had one on a ball of slow sinking maggots, and I've had another one by feeding in a, in a really weedy area and getting them grubbing around. So it was like I'd caught three fish from a tricky canal. I caught them on the way I would have caught them. And I've always told people that, you know, you can go to the, the hardest places in the world or the most renowned tricky... Just think about them as carp, you know. Mm. They like sun. They might like wind. They might like lack of pressure. They might just quite simply like a bit of bread, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, that was cool. Um, but you say that. I've seen... I've been very fortunate to be, go fishing with you a number of times. And, like, people, when we talk, when they talk about you using bread bombs and slow-sinking maggots, it's like it almost feels a bit agricultural, like you just chuck it out there and it happens <laughs> and whatever. But you will refine the sink rate of your ball of maggots and you'll refine the bit of bread and there's a lot more into it yeah, yeah, than yeah, what yeah. people do. Like, yeah. I remember first, and this is just me spitballing and bore people to tears, but I remember first sort of seeing you catch fish on bread bombs and chucking bread bombs out and having absolutely no appeal to fish because I was using a massive half a loaf of blinking white Hobus bread. But then you start to refine that method down like you do and it becomes literally an art form in itself, doesn't it? I've seen yeah. you flick a bunch of maggots to the point where 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 cast at the same fish and eventually yeah. you nail it you f sort of get the balance right and the sink rate right it has it and you're done whereas other people would have gone oh it's not having it I'm, I'm moving on do yeah. you know what it, I mean? it, it goes back to those early years when we talked about last time that Pimlico farm mm. summers spent on there spring summers and autumn spent on there just hunting stalking floater fishing forgot it all wanted to be a so-called proper carp angler yeah. with three or four rods with spot rods with bait boats and all of that out of my depth rekindled that understanding that if you can find one, if you're quiet enough on the approach, if you cast and don't fuck that cast up, you know, if you use a hook bait that they're receptive to at least showing some interest towards, if you strike at the absolute right moment when that's not too late, not too soon, you know, you can catch massive carp doing that. <laughs> yeah, and I've yeah. proved it time and time yeah, and yeah. time again. A lot of it, you've just touched on it, mate, balls down to people try it. They watch me in a film like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely... But they don't try enough. It'd be like me with casting. It'd be like, I really want to hit 30 wraps. I can't hit 30 wraps for shit, by the way. But I, <laughs> it'd be like me wanting to, going yeah. out now, giving it six casts and going, nah, I can't hit 30 wraps. Yeah, yeah. You know, but if yeah. I went out there and constantly practiced and practiced and practiced... I absolutely know I can hit 30 wraps. Like, yeah. It, and I can't relate, uh, I can't express that anymore to anyone watching this if you think that, well, I've tried doing what he's doing, but it didn't work. I tried it many times. Like, my whole life I've been trying it to the yeah. point that you, you, yeah, you get relatively good at it. Like, yeah, yeah. So, obviously, we talked about this sort of four-year period, if you like. You've gone into product development. You and Chloe have been on various trips away. You've started to spread your rings professionally with regards to 
China trip. China development. So we're well, we're like seven, eight years yeah, now in yeah. something like that, Hassan. What what else has happened? What pivotal moments, things happened? Um, I started filming. I started being filmed. Mm. So some of those trips, I've got the cassette tapes from Austria, for example, where I took the video cameras, documented it. Nothing ever come of it, but I'm now self-filming. Um, I'm being filmed. I can remember like yesterday, my first ever time having, it what was, was that? Carp TV. Yes. And we just launched a Box Logics range, oh, and yeah. I had to stand there and basically give them a complete rundown on what to do with this box, what to put in that box. That was my first ever time being filmed. Um, How was that? It was all right. Was like, it? Yeah, no, it felt all right, but it it would have been like I can't remember because I haven't watched it or I haven't seen it for years. But it would have probably been pretty dreadful, to be fair. But at the time, it felt all right. You know, I'd re- a bit like this. Not that I have rehearsed it. But yeah, I would have wrote down what I thought I was going to say or wanted to say, yeah. tried to remember most of it and try to project myself in the right way and, and stuff. But yeah, then it soon led on to more filming um, and I embraced it. I think why, you know, this is when, you know, we touch more on it, I think, in the next one. But the two real key people were Ollie and Winston. Mm. Ollie's still with us, obviously. He's best mate. And, and Winston isn't. But they were really integral in, in this, making all this happen. They made me feel comfortable. They made me feel at ease. They were like, Alan, just be you. Just go fishing, yeah. you know. What I did back to help them was I made sure I turned up really organised. I made sure I roughly knew what I was going to say. It wasn't, they weren't dealing with a... You know, sh- someone who had no initiative or... Uh, we talk about what we wanted to achieve before and we'd yeah. go there, I'd graft hard, I'd do everything I can to deliver in terms of carp on the bank and we worked very well as a team in that respect and it was the birth of, of Urban Banks and uh, and then later Eurobanks, which I know mm. we'll touch on properly next time. Uh, we made some great films together. Um, around this time... Um, I'm spending more and more time in Europe. Yeah. more. We're now going into more territories as a brand, um, which means I've got to attend more shows and shop days and meet shops. And my time in Europe is becoming more, which was a blessing because I'd had this period, you know, of not enjoying the Essex circuit waters. I didn't want a man a ticket. I didn't want to find it. I didn't want to be that angler. I'd found a little thing that made me happy again, which was the shorter sessions, the stalking, the sight fishing. But then I went to Europe a bit and I was like, hang on a minute, like the grass is actually greener on the other side. And I think one of my fondest memories were we had this concept to do like this fishery roadshow where we would turn up at fisheries with a team. We would have like a casting zone, a bait zone, a terminal tackle zone. And we would invite people free of charge to come and meet with us, spend time with us. We would try and give them any help or knowledge we possibly could mm. in a lake environment. And it was just a yeah, a way of trying to do something for people that wanted to learn a bit more about fishing. So yeah, yeah. I did a load of these in England, but we also did them in Europe. And I remember doing this one right at the, at the start of this sort of fishery roadshow campaign. And it was in Belgium. Yeah. Fantastic lake. But it was busy, you know, and there was a lot uh, of our high, our high profile Dutch and Belgium team were all fishing around it. And I remember of, on the first evening... Everyone was like, you're going to get the rods out, Alan. And I just remember looking, thinking, I can't think of anything worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really couldn't. Yeah. But just like behind it, Hassan, classic Belgium, Holland, massive bit of canal. Yeah. I remember going for a walk along it, thinking, bloody hell, it's massive, you know. It's like needle and a haystack stack jobber. You'd have to pre-bait for weeks and months to, to stand a chance. But I remember walking along it on my own, and I came to this really large sort of area that had widened up and it was much more industrial and there was a couple of inflow pipes and that and I I sort of stood there I didn't see any signs or anything but I thought if I was a carp in this stretch I'd be it you know and I walked back down um, to the thing and I politely had dinner with everyone probably had a beer and I said you know what I'm actually going to go up there and I'm going to flick the rods out and I did I remember at the time using little pineapple um, pop-ups on choddies because it was Again, it was that confidence thing. I knew that if you fished with a choddy and you fished it well with a semi-slack line, wherever I cast it, I was going to be fishing. So I've gone up there, chucked out these choddies, and I fucking had one. And it was like mid-30, 33. Yeah, yeah. And it was, but it was like this proper black common. And I just remember thinking, 
mate, the grass is greener. Wow. Like, there's no one fishing here. Yeah. There's no rules, so to speak. I can go anywhere I want on this stretch. There's no other anglers. Yeah. And look what I've just caught, man. And it was a real eye-opener for me. And ever since then, really, I was using these trips to Europe to get in angling and stuff. Up until that point, if I'd have been doing a show... Um, you know, you probably know it yourself, Hassan. There's a culture around the shows of an evening, especially some of the big ones like Zwaller or stuff. You all end up sort of in the same hotels, which means it's one big piss up. Yeah. Um, and I embrace that massively. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah really, let's get trashed in that. But you, it involves very little sleep. And then the following morning you feel shit. And then you've got to represent the brand on the stand. And it was... It was okay, I was young enough to just about be able to get out of bed and ju have some breakfast and focus. But as the years wore on, I was like, this ain't the one, man. Then I've got this glimpse of how incredible the carp fishing was in Europe. And ever since then, I've carried on doing all the shows. In fact, I've done more than ever. I've carried on doing more shop days, yeah. but I never stay in a hotel. I always no, I fish, you know, bruv. And, yeah. and what it does is people are like, you fish so much. Yeah, I fish so much because I don't take maybe the easier option of staying in a hotel with a bottle of red and a fillet steak and that. Grab a surface station meal and get on the bank. And it's caught me so many fish. So many fish. Yeah. If, if I'd have stayed in a hotel all of those times of all those trips away and stuff, oh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have caught half the beautiful, incredible carp I've caught, you know, mm. by just pushing myself a little bit harder. It's, yeah. yeah, incredible. You know, so that was a real big introduction into Europe. Um, and then social media came along. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, social media came one. along. I'm really late to the party. Um, didn't have Facebook, pre-Facebook. What was it like? Was it MySpace? Yeah, people have MySpace. Didn't yeah. do any of that. You know, I've never been on it. I've never been very techy. Um, even yeah. now, like designing the luggage and that, I'm still doing it with a ruler and a pencil and a rubber. And that's me. I'm post-it notes. And so I'm not a techie person. So this whole social media thing just did not appeal um, at all. But, you know, the likes of Carl Smith mm. uh, and others, I'll never forget, especially with the Instagram stories, Carl was like, you, there's a wave at the moment and you need to fucking ride it. And if you don't, you've missed a massive opportunity to further your career and stuff. And yeah. When you got someone like Co, who I you know, hold in the highest regard, yeah, so I embraced it. Yeah. I went on Instagram, I went on Facebook. I, I'm off Facebook now. It's shit. I'm done with it. The negative. <laughs> uh, it's dreadful, Hassan. It's dreadful. It's horrible. Like, absolutely. What a horrible platform. Like, or, <laughs> am, I, am I speaking out of turn? Or? No, like, there's definitely a lot of negativity and a lot of people that. Why? Why that do that to yourself? Bent, yeah. Why just do that to there. yourself? I say it to Ollie all the time. Like, Ollie, why would you do that to yourself? Why would you argue with people? And, and But he enjoys it. So. He likes a bite, yeah. yeah he, he likes does. a bite. But for me, I'm trying to live a, a very positive life. The moment there's any element of negativity, it's rubbing off on everything around me, my work, other members of staff, my family, my fishing. So the more positivity, the more, the how, more enjoyment I've got out of a day and stuff. On that note, how did you find that change to social media? Because straight away... Even early days, you are very, you're much more sort of contactable directly by your sort of customer base. Before, there was like the DVDs that you filmed, yeah. and there'd be people sort of maybe putting the odd article out in the press. But other than that, there's no real feedback directly apart from if somebody rings you up. Yeah. Whereas now, you've got a profile, there is negativity, yeah. but it's directly at you. Yeah. Like, there's no filter on it. <laughs> How was so, that? Um, you got to have thick skin. Is the first thing, you know, and I have struggled with it from time to time. I think you were with us recently when I was talking about in the office about the YouTube comments. It's, yeah, going, that, that, it's going that way now with YouTube. It seems to be a lot yeah. of... Ne and, yeah, it's easy to let that get to you. In, in some people's cases, it's easy to bite, you know, but that never is the solution, you know, to bite back and stuff. Um, yeah, I just try and black it out, blank it out. Um, try and like you know there's so many positive comments that you always just try and but yeah it is awkward I suppose for me Hassan I am quite unique in terms of I don't really engage no you don't nah bad in it no I don't think yeah, it's bad it is I think bad. it's I think it's pretty with knowing it from the inside out mm. and I know people well like Jules Jules Cunliffe for example every he engages he's on it yeah but 
Jules doesn't have necessarily the same day-to-day responsibilities yeah. that you do. So it's, I feel, it's different. Anyone watching this, like I, I mean it, I feel bad. And it was Claudia Dargo who made me really feel bad. Yeah, I remember she her gave, she gave me a stern bollocking, like but as I tried to explain to her, Claudia, mine and your situations are very, very different, you know. And I mean this, guys, if if tomorrow I didn't have to do the stuff I do have to do, mm. I promise you I'd reply to all of you and I'd engage with all of you. But I haven't been on Instagram other than just flicking through, which in itself is a disaster because you end up in these dreadful wormholes not getting anything done. But basically I haven't posted this year. I haven't done any Insta stories this year. And that's just down to, you know, I'm juggling balls whether that be a development, whether that be marketing, whether that might be, in this instance, COVID-related or break, it could be anything, yeah, but there's loads of balls that are getting juggled in my life, none more so than my family, Mm. and I love fishing, and there's this social media ball, and at the start of this year, as much as had some lovely family time over Christmas and that, and I felt it was going to be a relatively easy going starting to the new year it hasn't been no and it's been very very stressful and I've had a lot of work to do and something has to give you know some I don't want all the balls to just fall on the floor so I just set a couple down man and I've had to set fishing down um I've had to set social media down I'll pick them back up soon yeah you know um so social media really important to the business is it really important to me no no not really I'd, if I could come off it tomorrow, would you? Gone. Gone. Hence why there's no guilt of that, not even hope. Yeah, yeah. All I've got to do on Facebook is um, hit that s- sort of yeah, swipe yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah. And nah, it's on. I don't even want them getting it. They don't deserve it, in my opinion. They don't deserve it. I don't even want to fuel their love of negativity. So mm. I won't even... Pa- and yeah, the same for social... It's all for the business. You know, what I do... I have to say I do like the fact I've got an Instagram wall and it's like my memories, if you know what I yeah. mean. Because my photos are strewn across so many external hard drives and stuff. At least if I want to smile and think how lucky I am and or how much of an amazing life I've got, I can look and go, yeah, man, what an amazing... Yeah. So that's cool. Um, but yeah, the, like Insta stories is a hindrance and it's hard work. You know, Hassan. It You're is spearheaded hard. like that influencer... Good morning, you beautiful people. Like, uh, I'm Hassan, and today, we're, you know, to do that every day. Yeah, to turn up if is you, hard. If you just had to do that, Hassan, yeah, it's okay, mate. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when... No. It, it is hard. So. It is hard. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, we touched on a little bit there, family-wise. Now, yeah. obviously, you and Clay, you've had your trips, you've been away. In amongst all this development yeah. and all this change and all your growth and yeah. the company's growth, you've... Obviously, had, had your first family. child. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How about... So, I'm guessing at some point you went, right, okay, so now's a good time to have, I have bas- kids. I basically turned 30. Big party. <laughs> Big party. <laughs> and, then, and then basically I was like, hey, I'm getting old. I am getting old. You know, I'm not 18 anymore. I'm not 21 anymore. And if I'm going to have children... Mm which I've always wanted and Chloe's always wanted. Yeah. It's just kind of been like not at top of my priority list. But I, I realised that, yeah, we need to, um, well, I need to take it a lot more seriously yeah. and um, show some commitment. And yeah, we had a, our first child. It was How was that? Um, a bit of a blur because I'm yeah. still juggling those balls. I didn't take any maternity leave or anything like that. And yeah, because... Oh, just, it was a whirlwind. Yeah. We talked about it just before, didn't we? I had to ring Chloe because labour was long and, yeah, it was like 12, 13 hours. You got a rollicking in I got a rollicking. This you? is what we were talking about. Yeah, I kept falling asleep. I'd been working hard all that <laughs> yeah, week. I yeah. shattered. It was through the night and she gave me a massive bollocking and said, like, if you do not fucking wake up, Alan, I'm going to ring my mother. You can fuck off. You can go fishing. Go back to work if you want, but you're not staying here. And I had fixed up like well we'll sort yourself here we go um so yeah we had the baby maya um and yeah what's that is right because i can only go by my experience but for you i probably when i had my first kid was very busy but not alan blair busy how did that change things or did that just not change things and you made it fit with you i don't want to sit here i i don't want to lie about anything um it changed nothing (laughs) <laughs> yeah. absolutely nothing 
whatsoever. Yeah. And it hasn't to this point. And that was probably because me and Chloe, we talk and I yeah. didn't lead her down a garden path. She's only ever known me to be that way. I think that's really important in our relationship from the day we got together really nothing's changed in terms of who I am, my how driven I am, yeah. the partying, uh, the fishing, you know. So it, it's like, I think going into that, let's have a family together, mm. I didn't ever sit there and go, babe, let's have a family together. And the moment that our first child's born, I'm not going to work long hours anymore yeah. and I'm going to slow down with my fishing. I never promised that. So literally, we've got the baby in hospital and wow, I'm a dad, close a mum. Right, I'm going to work. Yeah, real talk. Real talk. I didn't take, a, didn't take a day off. Yeah. yeah. And people might be listening thinking, oh, you, what a blo- you horrible just- man. Like, you <laughs> horrible, horrible man. But you've got to understand, like I say... We both knew that was going to be the situation. Yeah. I hadn't promised I was going to take f- six weeks maternity leave or anything like that. She knew that I was going straight back to work. Um, I just hadn't led anyone down a garden path. And I think the most important pe- things, pe- the thing that people need to understand is Chloe was put on this earth to be a mum. Yeah. Like she was. Yeah. She is like the the pinnacle of being the perfect mother so crack on babe yeah fulfill your life dream like of being the best mum i'm gonna support you as much as i possibly can and i don't want people to watch you go what you never go home you never do anything with your kids you like you <laughs> yeah but no like it, we talked before hassan yeah, you're the yeah. one who has to get up at night i weren't the one getting up at night yeah, yeah i was at three o'clock to go back to work again like yeah, yeah. and if there was a baby crying i'd like nudge Chloe and go there's a baby crying like yeah. you better go sort <laughs> yeah, it out yeah. like you know i don't want people to, you know people to think yeah, but you must have done this. no i went to work yeah i've supported the family i've made sure we can have the nice holidays and all yeah, the nice yeah. things and and yeah, I changed some nappies. And yes, I've, yeah, yeah, of course, cool. I went to all the first days at schools and uh, as they've grown up. But I'm not probably the role father. I don't know what that is. No, what there is isn't that? one. Is is what is that? Has? I don't one. know. But, you know, at home now, close homeschooling. Yeah. I'm not. I'm working. Yeah. yeah. You know. Um, but as yeah. you say, that is not, a, that is not a, in a way that somebody's had to sacrifice something to make that happen. Close that end of the aspect keeps that going. Yeah. Uh, keeps then, uh, it going and some, you know, if, if, if God forget bid, like if I drop down dead tomorrow, those two girls would still have the best parenting upbringing because of her, mm. you know, I, I, I really do think I play a part and, and stuff, but not to the degree that she does. No. She is incredible. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Totally. But uh, it goes back to, I've touched on it this time, touched on it. No one's perfect. Hassan. No. There isn't a perfect human being out there. No. And, yeah. And yeah, my girls, like any father would say, the best things ever. Yeah, like, yeah. I have the best times with them. Okay, granted, it's on my terms. So I get to come home from work and I'm the best dad ever because yeah. I'm not the one who's been shouting at them all day. I'm yeah. not the one who's been making them do homeschooling all day. I'm yeah. not the one. You're the so fun one, mate. Yeah, really harsh, like on <laughs> Chloe, because yeah. I get a lot of love from them. Not that she doesn't, but I get a lot of almost unjust love. I sh- I don't deserve the love those two little girls give me, because she deserves ten times more than me. But yeah, I make sure that they have lovely days out. Yeah, and they have all the things that they wish for within reason. I'm also the one who's. You know, just like myself, just like Kev has with me, just what my dad done with me, you know. Money don't go on trees, girls. No, they yeah. They know what a day's graft is. They will... Well, they can eat. see that, though, as well, mate, can't yeah, mate. they? Even at this age, Hassan, like, I'm, you know, they have to work for that little tiny bit of pocket money. And it's been helped massively by the fact that, you know, we've gone fishing and made films together because if they don't toe the line on a film shoot, 
You ain't getting no pocket money this week. <laughs> of course. No, you know, it, they've got, we got a job to do, you know, yeah. and, you know, they are young ladies that lose their shit as much as any little kids and that. But when I've got two cameramen desperately trying to get one shot of a lift of a car, please, girls, just please behave for this shot, you know. So, uh, yeah, you see these beautiful films of us in, and it very much is like that. Yeah. But they also know that if they behave really well and work really hard and help daddy to do this job, because it is a job. Yeah. I'll make sure they get a couple of pounds at the end of yeah, the week. Yeah, like, right. Um, do they love fishing? They love coming fishing. Yeah. But they're not fisher ladies. They're too young. Yeah, yeah they're, they're too young, Six and mate. seven, aren't they, mate? Yeah, so Maya, six months. Both of them, you've seen the photos, at days after they were born, they were on the bank. Yes. Uh, Maya, at six months, she'd been in... She'd Belgium with us. We went and had a big, wow. big adventure around Belgium, and yeah, both the girls have been very blessed to have travelled, you know, all the way to New Zealand, for, yeah. for example, but many places over Europe for really crazy fishing sessions. And yeah, they much like Chloe at some point in the day or the session go fucking fishing is so shit, Dad. Like, can't we do something good? And, Let's go chase fairies. But when it, yeah, but but that's how you that's how you make a day yeah. good. You know, you do a little bit of fishing, a little bit of fairy hunting, a little bit of a nice picnic, a barbecue, and and you break the day up and stuff. Um, did you ever worry that they that they wouldn't embrace that lifestyle? How could a child not? Is my take on it. Yeah. I, I don't. I can't see any other way. If it doesn't matter whether you're Russian, Chinese, American, mm. English, British, whatever, whatever race or culture, whatever sex. Because that was another thing. I really wanted boys. Of course did I did. Did you? Yeah, man. 100%. Of course I, can't I did. Say, oh, yeah, I was yeah, I wanted boys because I wanted to take my little boy fishing with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, th- what's happened is I've taken my little girls fishing with me and it makes no difference whatsoever. No. But um, yeah, did I? Did, how, how could a child with the right guidance not love it? Yeah. I can't see how, personally, being outdoors, getting dirty, climbing on things, catching insects and bugs and having picnics and having yeah. an adventure. I think yeah. it all boils down a lot of it, a lot of my life, certainly in the last sort of 10 years, my own fishing and my children's upbringing has revolved around that word adventure. Mm. What do you want to do today, girl? You fancy going and having an adventure? Yeah, dad. You know, and it was no different with my dad. It was no different yeah. with Kev saying, let's go to La Gomera. Let's go to this island. Let's go and have an adventure. And I think I forgot a lot of that in some of my years where yeah. I wanted to be a carp angler. Yeah. And I think, I don't think my perception of a carp angler, they don't really have adventures. They get a ticket somewhere, they get all the gear, get all the bait, and they go and sit there and they put themselves, I did anyway, I'm, I'm only speaking on myself, I put myself through hell, yeah. sitting in shit swims, blanking in shit conditions, like wasting away a weekend when I could have been doing something far more productive. Yeah, it, There was never, the word adventure never crept into that. This last 10 years and my children, it's just, hey, let's just have an adventure. Yeah. Whether that's just going to your local canal, your local park lake, down to your local day ticket lake, or traveling to the other side of the world, <laughs> we're having an adventure. Yeah. I mean, it's and it's, it's there's a theme throughout all of it work and obviously private life and everything which is which is so genuine but it is your energy because a lot of people and again I'm speaking through through mates that I know and people that I know will work really hard they will come home and they will be shattered that will be it but you're out on weekends having your adventures with your girls when you've yeah. got some time and that intensity is still there even in your sort of parent, which it should be, yeah. of course. But obviously sometimes you are absolutely spent. How do you, and you get this question a lot, but how does that, how do you maintain that intensity through work and through your private life? Because sometimes you sleep less than I do. I do sleep yeah. a lot, but it's intense. <laughs> you, you, asked me, you asked me the question earlier, you were like, you're right, Al. I was like, nah, I'm a bit stressed, bro. Yeah. It, it happens. And, and this, the start of this year has been very stressful. Um, I put some of the balls down, first thing. Um, how do I keep on going? But it's not that you put the balls down yeah, because I that's did. volume. Put, but that's volume. That's volume. That's volume. That what you do, you will still do 22 hours of, of whatever the balls are that are in Maybe, play. maybe. 
you know, I people, there's a misconceived idea I don't sleep. Or if you've watched all of the Eurobanks, you'll think all I ever do is sleep, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. But, you know, I, you know, to answer your question, I go to sleep quite early, Hassan. Mm. I think people should be very aware of that. I'm not sitting up. Sometimes I am, but I, I like everyone. I'm just human and I need sleep. So I will endeavour to, if I'm going to get up at three, four, five even in the morning, don't go to bed at midnight, one o'clock. You know, I look at Oh, he loves a late night. He loves mm. sitting there, light room in photos at one, two o'clock in the morning. Mate, I'm thinking about getting up then, you know, and yeah. he's not getting up till nine or 10, you know, so everyone's different. So that would be the first thing. I think by having a job that you love, how could I not want to yeah. come to work? I literally wake up, you know, I might rub my eyes and get the sleep out of it, jump in the shower to wake myself up. I might still be really tired, but on that drive to work, I'm going to do the best thing yeah. ever. I'm going to do what I love. Like, so, yeah, it just feel really lucky of a weekend. I, I'm going to go fish. I'm going to spend it with my family. I'm going to go party. And I've just basically, it's happiness in it. It it's goes back yeah. to that thing. Like, how can I... I, I picked a job and a career that makes me happy. It's a combination also. And in your nature, like you said in the first podcast, you are all in, aren't you? Yeah. So whatever you do... It's shit, yeah. I'm going to do it properly. Or I'm going to at least try and do it properly. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely... Do you feel that... And this is... <laughs> answer this however you would take it, however you want. Do you feel that that is something that you can sustain? At the moment... You know, because this is that's a really good question, Hassan. Because it, and it, I've had it a lot. You're gonna blow. You're gonna burn out. You're gonna have a heart attack. You know, this is gonna end badly. But when you've been doing it, let's go all the way back. You know, when everyone else had one paper round, I had five paper mm. rounds. I've do every shift I can. I've worked in bars and hotel. Everything just graft, 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 graft. Fish, fish, party, party. Never missed a day off work. Finish party and go straight to work. I've never felt I couldn't do it. Okay. So I've I've always done it. Is my body becoming older? Is it harder to get up off the floor now when I've just picked the carp up or I've released it? Yeah, my bones are aching a little bit and my muscles do ache more. Will I be able to maintain it? I don't know, mate. I don't know. Do I mentally and physically feel like tomorrow is going to be the best day ever, another big adventure, and I'm going to work? Yeah, I do. Mm. Could, is 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 are a lot of people, and it is a lot of people. Are a lot of people going to be able to turn around with me in hospital or on my deathbed or even dead and go? I fucking told him. I told him he needed to slow down. I told him maybe, but I'll have had a lot of fun it's getting to terms. that point. Yeah, I'll have had a lot of fun, and yeah. Do you I ever just, think what gets me there is, and this is just speaking to you over the course of these two pods, is it? A lot of the things that you've got into, there's been a relative sort of maybe short-term plan, but there hasn't necessarily been like a real great 10, 15 long vision. Not really, mate. Like when there is, and I said it in the, the carpology piece, yeah, when I'm 50, I'd like to stop. I'd like to retire to a degree. But Kev will argue with me that I won't, and I think he's right. You, no, you don't. No, you won't. Yeah, we all just go travelling and fishing, Kev. You, you won't, won't do that. He's, he says you won't like it. He said, you've, there's, you've got too much more to give You'd him be So I don't know, Hassan. I just, what I do know is, in 2020, I started the year off taking the girls to Stenhill Fisheries. We saw the new year in with sparklers, with fireworks. Chloe and I had a bottle of champagne and we caught some really beautiful carp. Mm. And I was convinced in my head that 2020, what? yeah, 2020. No, this is, so this is last New Year's, not New Year's just gone. I was convinced in my head that 2020 is going to be the best year ever. Like every year, I always think it's going to be better than the last. So yeah. it's the best year ever. And I had some really serious trips planned. I had some big social parties planned. In fact, so much, 50 of us were going, 55 of us were going to Croatia, all anglers with their wives. We were oh all nice. fast. We were going partying on the beach in Croatia. I had all these, and it was going to be the best year ever. And then what happened? Yeah. COVID. COVID, mate. So if, if, you know, and it wasn't that I wasn't aware of this saying, but people are like, you don't know what's around the corner. Mm. What's around the corner? Will you walk across the street and get hit by a bus? And if it was ever a fucking 
2020 proved to me I did not see this thing called coronavirus come in no. and look where we still are now with regards to it. So what can I say? Could, you know, could I slow down? Should I be more conscious? Should I save more money and stop buying clothes and eating lavishly and having these holidays? Should I think more about... But what I don't know what's going to happen in the future. No. So I'm working on the principle. Be happy today. Try and be happy tomorrow. Try and make sure for the work and for the business, you know what's coming up. And there are plans in place. And we do in our product development. We're working two, three years ahead. In our marketing strategies, we're working 12 to 18 months ahead. You know, but really, I'm most worried about today. Yeah. I'm most worried about having a good day today and tomorrow is tomorrow because I honestly don't know anymore. I could have with the right people saying to me, Alan, think more about the long-term plan. Think more about it. But look at coronavirus. No, like, yeah, yeah. So what do I do? Like wrap my children up in cotton wool or, you know, save all the money I earn so they can, you know, be secure. In, I don't... Th there is no right or wrong, Hassan, but no. I think... Being happy is, is good enough for me. Being happy and content today and short term is, is a good enough yeah, I like that. Man for me. So casting, oh, there you go. There's a pun for you, mate. Casting back to um, you and the development of social media. Mm -hmm. You're fishing around this time. You're, you're, obviously, <coughs> work is ramped up. So we're talking about a lot of work fishing. You are you doing much that's that sort of anything that's your own or is it nah, all so just it, in it relation really, to it? Don't take don't take it wrong, Asan. I I do get the odd session every year, uh, the odd trips for myself. But if you take like family fishing holiday, yeah, it started off as a family fish or well, as a family holiday for a bit of fishing, but and rightly so, the media department were like, well, just film it, Alan, just self film it. Who's yeah, that, it, Yeomans? No, it weren't Danny. I don't even think he was working here at the time. It would have been Carl, yeah. Winston. I think Winston might have gone. But basically, they're like, well, just film it. Well, if anyone's ever self-filmed themselves, you it's like anything in life. You can do as little or as much. As you just highlighted, I like to try and do things the best I possibly mm. can. So what started off as a family break to get away, all of a sudden, I'm like rolling cameras from morning till night. And <laughs> yeah. it becomes... Comes work, bruv, more than anything. Yeah, Don't yeah. get me wrong. You know, you get to take your family away and do that. But it, it, it's work. Everything just had an agenda. Every possible fishing thing had an agenda. And the only things I can think of are the multi-species stuff, which is not really Nash related. No. So I'd have trips to the Y for the barbel. I'd go down to the test for the grayling. I'd, I had a good couple of lakes around here for the roach, you know, and caught lots of big roach and that. And they were my little me time because, yeah. but even them, I can think packed. Like I've done plenty of roach features from Improve Your Course Fishing or I've done barbel features for the May or... Well, now they're on the story, aren't they? And now they're on the story. So nothing is, is unavoidable in that respect. Um... I'm not moaning. No. God, how lucky am I? I get yeah, paid yeah. get paid sometimes to, to, to fish and stuff. But, nah, you know, really from that, that social media area, everything, there was no campaigns, there was no tickets. The last campaign I did, I did a good season, but it ain't really. It's a few sessions on the River Chelmer. Yeah. I really enjoyed that, man. Yeah. It, I, it was on my own terms. Um, I could pre-bait, I could fish. I learned off the back of Kev's, where do they want to be and spend their time? I found all that out and I had a good result there. After that, really, and I, I just wrote down there, everything became an adventure. Yeah. And I, I've had hundreds, hundreds here, there, everywhere, all the different countries with friends, without friends, on my own, with family. What are some of your best? Come on, mate. The adventures. I can't really, like, because there's been so many. Yeah. There really has, Hassan. It's just been... Once I got my head around carp fishing, once I got my head around the fundamentals, it became not easy. I don't want to lead anyone down the garden path, but it became logical. Things were logical. Yeah. And as long as I went away thinking about the fundamentals, um, I planned exciting venues. I went with good people. Everything became an adventure. I referenced it just a minute ago. You know, I can go to my local park lake with the girls. Um, as long as I've got sawn off with me, we can turn what could have just been a session on the swings to 
a full blown adventure, like yeah. up a tree, hooking one out of the tree, jumping out of the tree, girls landing it, or they you know, it all became it just life became all about that, making sure each and every time was an adventure. Um, yeah. and I've I've been really lucky to have had some mega trips. Yeah. Mega, mega trips, you know, taking carp fishing out of it. I went to Florida. I know you've been yeah. there yourself. I went with Matt and Tom and what, what an adventure, you know, three nice. young lads, like big pocket of cash and, you know, the, the old, the world your oyster or in this instance, Florida was, yeah. Uh, yeah, we just went on an adventure, hired a motor, hadn't booked. I'll never forget, like we ended up in, in Key West, Island Marauder or somewhere and we've just tipped up there thinking and we're just going book a chart, but everything's booked. Yeah. You know, we didn't know this. We didn't realise yeah. how much of a destination it really was. Like, and uh, everyone's looking at us like, "Are you mad? Like, you, you just think you can turn up here and walk out?" On a sh yeah, that's like bowling up at Redmo and saying, oh, "I've yeah, got a yeah, rod, yeah, mate." Yeah. That's a great analogy. This is such that. Do you know what, mate? That is perfect. Tapping on me. <laughs> Les Bamford, hi, um, is it all right to drop on for a day? Like, <laughs> and that was us. We, there was us in Florida. Like, yeah, we just come to um, book a trip. Uh, you need to do that six months in advance. So, but yeah, we ended up getting out with this rogue, like proper rogue little boat. And uh, mate, it was everything. It was mad. We you were, had a good one though, didn't you? Because it's on, it's on a uh, life at night. Yeah, we it? caught some big tarp on and we caught some loads of shark, big sharks. And of an evening, we'd stay in really nice places we decided to you know really do a bit of dough on this it was kind of a once in not once in a lifetime but at that point it was the the most elaborate expensive trip the three of us had, had ever been on and that so we weren't we didn't hold back on where we stayed in lovely places and yeah. i remember of an evening like going out to the beach or the the jetty and that we got our scopes with us and We'd like, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. I said, I mean, like, you talk about how I was out of debt for my carp fishing. Like, yeah, you put yeah, yourself yeah. in those oceans and that with a scope rod, like, oh, with man. a bit of Power Pro and a whatever big shark hook and that. And we were like, hooking, yeah, got spooled a couple of times and like, just hooking thing. You never see them. You never see, you know, they never stopped. Like, yeah. they just carried on. And um, it was a, it was a crazy adventure. Yeah. We fished in. Miami, we fished in the drains. We we just embraced it and, and lived country, it. Mate. Yeah, alligator country. So like, I'll never forget the first one I see. I'm trying to catch it. You're I'm, trying to catch it? Yeah, of it. course. Of what course. Do you mean, of course. <laughs> of course. There's a great big alligator there and I'm like banging big lures past it to see if it will snap on. What are you going to do? Which is really it? unethical, I know, guys. But like, What are you going to do if it takes I a I don't lure? know, but I was just in <laughs> awe of these creatures <laughs> and like... There's some part of human nature that yeah. goes... That is an alligator. That could probably do me some damage. Like, I don't want to bring it any closer to yeah, me. Yeah, but I don't know. It was just, it was just, you know, Samir, like, and Samir and Gaz, so that they'd, like, this Boy Scout adventure, mm. Boy Scout business. And it was, that's what it felt like. Three youngish lads yeah. in a different country, like, just living that American dream. It, it was our American dream, anyway. That was a cool one. Um, what else has been really cool? New Zealand was pretty <sighs> epic. If it's for another, have you been? Yeah, of course you have. The fly fishing, yeah, mate. Yeah, so it was a sad twist of events that took us there. Mother was basically on her deathbed, but um, you know, to spend those two weeks there, you would have never thought it. Mm. She was like the the happiest person, like just like she'd always been. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. But you know, so parking all that up and and stuff. We went there for that reason. Mm. But we made every day. She she created a saying while we were there, and um, it stuck with me a lot. Um, and that was the best day ever. And I suppose it relates exactly to what I was saying about happiness. She was just like every day. She was strictly warned by the the, the nurses and the doctors. All she was supposed to be doing was laying in bed, mm. dying. Yeah, you know, uh, she knew she was going to die. She, you know, she was riddled with cancer and stuff. So. She had two options. She could have took the nurse's uh, advice and that and rested, and she didn't. She was like, we're going to have today. Today, guys, we're going to have the best day ever. I'm going out of the bag. Yeah, and, she, and it was amazing. And it integrated into that, I caught um, some really cool fish mm. in her presence as well. You asked me before, did mum did mum fish? Do you remember? Yeah, and I was like, one. nah. She embraced it, and she supported it, and she took me, and she she did so much for me. But she never really fished with me, and I never had a photo with her. 
You know, I no. let you know, man. How mad's that? In in all those 34 years, thirty four years, I, I haven't got a photo with my mum with a fish and that, but I made it happen when we were in, in New Zealand, and yeah, we caught some cool carp. We went trout fishing, sea fishing every day, so you that was cool. Caught carp in New Zealand? Yeah, lots, mate. I never caught a carp in. I caught loads yeah. of trout, endless amounts of trout. Yeah, so we caught. Um, I caught. Uh, when we were with her on the South Island, I caught uh, a grassy, um, a classic mum, like, and my dad's exactly the same. Um, we arrived at this sort of country park and um, there was a giant notice board. You might have seen this when you're over there. They're obviously a really strict country yeah. in terms of their ecology and biosecurity and everything. You've yeah. got it, bro. I remember like getting to the airport and um, very innocently of us in one of the girls' bags, there was a, like a, one of them little mini apples, gala apple or whatever. Yeah. And we've like, in their eyes, tried to smuggle it through. Totally didn't, but we got a really stern talking to. That's just one apple. So, yeah, we got to this country park one day and there's this massive billboard, like notice board, basically highlighting a lot of non-native plant species, but they were like, the photos were this big. Yeah. The photo that took up the whole board was a carp, like, with a big arrow, like, cross through it. These are the devil's yeah. fish. Like, um, anyway, I've, like mentioned this to mum because she knows exactly what carp fishing is I'm working she knows everything she knows a lot about fishing she just didn't do it herself so she's going Ellen what's the problem like what? and she's that and, I'm, and uh, yeah she's she was from born in New Zealand she, she had a really strong accent and um I basically um we had a picnic we paddled we did whatever we did but I typical me I had to wander off and see if there was actually any carp residing in this yeah. this bit of water and I found some like in this little bay and um I've gone back and um grabbed a, a sauna I've got the GoPro a couple of guys had another camera angle and I managed to get it on like two or three angles yeah, got this wicked. bit and uh she was absolutely typical doing her nut like we're gonna get arrested we're gonna I said mum chill out man like, yeah you're on your deathbed <laughs> like <laughs> like just let's have a lovely family photo and yeah. yeah that's one i'll cherish you know and then we went to the waikato river which was a huge sheet of water like yeah. not too dissimilar to like the thames in flood it was really chocolate Ooh, brown beauty. savage like sa and um i was sort of tipped off that it was full of carp uh, and it was and it was the first time i've a uh, first and last time i've ever seen bow hunt him Oh wow! Yeah. yeah, you seen it? Yeah, I've, I've seen videos. I've never seen no, it. In the but flesh. I see it in the flesh. So Oof. we 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 basically we were on our way back to Auckland, and um, we stopped in a little lay by, um, got out, had a picnic, cracked open a load of cans of corn, um, chucked them in a bucket, bit of sweet corn extract, and um, I walked along this bit of river. Um, looking for slacks, looking for weed beds that were creating slacks anywhere where the water wasn't so savage, and it was only a hundred odd meters. I'm like. Carp, 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 Ooh. carp. There's one on tipped up, you know, feeding on a bit of silt. So I've introduced a bit of corn. And um, yeah, we caught some little little koi. They're all koi. Yeah. You know, I didn't actually see a, a, a common or a mirror as such. They're all koi. Um, and yeah, the last night we stayed in, um, uh, we, we flew out of Auckland. We stayed in Auckland that night. So we were close to the airport for the flight. I jumped on Google Maps and um, I found this like sugar beet factory, which had some water within sort of walking distance of where we are staying. Um, again, sadly it was poaching, but I snuck into this place and um, lo and behold, there was quite a lot of carp and I went back the following morning just before having to get the flight and uh, yeah, caught another nice grass carp. So that was nice. a really cool adventure. Um, and as for actual carp fishing ones, I've been really lucky to have, seen lots of cool places um, and I know we're going to talk more about Eurobanks next time but yeah. outside of Eurobanks um, yeah I've been to some cool places Cassian was cool oh, um, yeah just loads mate even like even even last year 2020 with with coronavirus I still managed to um, had a really cool trip to France uh, caught some massive fish lots of big mm. fish um, to just over 70 pounds and I had a really cool trip to Germany um, with Toby, a yeah. mental road trip, like um, had some really big carp again, um, just many adventures. Before Christmas I went on a bit of a, a multi-species uh, adventure, um, just can't stress it enough to people that if you, if you find yourself in a rut with your angling where you're not enjoying it anymore and i speak on like personal experience here if you're not enjoying it 
evaluate what are the issues? Why are you not enjoying it? Because the reason that we do it is for enjoyment. And yeah. that's my philosophy now going forward. Just make each session uh, a mad adventure. What about for you ambitions or things that you, you want to do or want to achieve in fishing generally? You've done Florida. Like, yeah. is it a species-led thing? Yeah, for sure. A lot of it is species-led. What's I, left? I'm not interested at all in catching a bigger carp than the last big carp I've caught. Yeah. Um, I'm more interested in, and this is really subsurface-esque. Like, Here we go. Yeah, do you know what I mean? But I'm not that guy. But yeah, yeah I would rather catch a really nice one. And more importantly, I'd rather catch a really nice one from somewhere really interesting with my friends that would mean more to me than sitting on a water for X amount of mm. period of time and catching a bigger fish than what is deemed your biggest carp or personal best. So, yeah, I think I'm definitely species-led. Yeah. I'm adventure, cut new countries-led, meeting new people-led, which is why Eurobanks was yeah. the ultimate, you know. It was getting to go to places that I could only have ever dreamt of going to, and meeting people that became and are still lifelong friends. Yeah. Um, what would I really like to do, Hassan? Um, yeah, all of it, if I'm honest. All of it is all big. Of it, all of it. All of it is big. You're right. You know, so last year I had a trip planned to Norway. I've, it's actually rebooked for this year. Cod fishing? Yeah, cod and halibut. Oof, um, yeah, nice. But, you know, when I look at the situation, I'm going to go with Dan. Um, when I look at it, do I really want to catch big cod? Yeah, but once you've caught a few, you've kind of caught a big cod. I've caught cod before, you know, from British shores yeah, and stuff. But I know they're big. But how many big cod do you need to catch? One. Really? It's kind of one, isn't it? Yeah. And then halibut. How many halibut do I really need to catch? What excites me more is the scenery, yeah, the where potential opportunity to see the Northern Lights, the fact that I've never been on an adventure with Dan where it's not, it's hardcore work related. This mm. would have been like some very me and him time, which I was really relishing the opportunity to do because yeah. I've done lots of that with Ollie and Reedy and Tom and Chloe and and I, I love Dan to bits. So it would just be nice yeah. to just go for five days and have an adventure with him. Yes, it tick, tick in the box for a big card, tick in the box for a big halibut, but th there's a much bigger reason for, for wanting to do such things. Mm. Um, I would love to, of course, go to somewhere like the Amazon. I would love to go to America. I've never been, with the exception of Florida, I've done, I've never been to America. Um, and whether that's carp fishing or bass fishing or going to Alaska and salmon fish. I, what, I, what I learned a long time ago is we've only got a certain amount of time here. Mm. And there is only one guarantee in this life. And one day that is that I won't be here anymore. If... I get sucked into, for example, somewhere like Rainbow, or if I got sucked into, for example, I don't know, the Wazing Estate, yep. and I, for whatever reason, become obsessed with a particular target on there, and that target's going to consume the next three years of my life. What I'm really fearful of is what, there isn't enough time to do everything. Already I'm conscious that however much longer I'm on this earth for... I still won't do it all. No. Impossible. Yeah. So I'm I'm trying to grab every opportunity to try a little tiny bit of everything. And to this point, nothing's kind of grabbed me enough that if you take big carp fishing, for example, and, and circuit water fishing and fishing for a target, it hasn't grabbed me enough to not do all the other things I managed to do in the course of a year. I'd much rather just do loads of fun things than at the end of the year go, yeah, but no, but look, I really did. I caught the Burfield Comet. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's that's a choice thing, isn't it? You know, You've a lot of people would do any, they give their right arm to catch the Burfield oh, Comet. Yeah. Not me. No. I nah. can see There's that. no desire there to no. want to. Could Would I like to get... Would I like to go and have a guest on Burfield on a summer's day and walk around with my sawn off and think there's a chance that I might, mm -hmm. might, this is yeah. really ridiculous. Bump here. into it. Might bump into it. Yeah. Would I have a great day doing that? Could I maybe even do a week of doing that and potentially make, but could I devote to maybe three or however long? Yeah. No. I'd, I wouldn't enjoy it. That's fair. I've had it now, you know, before Christmas, I, 
uh, back in the late autumn, I went and filmed another episode of Urban Banks. Okay. And it wasn't a failure, right? but it's not yet complete. And without giving a huge amount away, Dan will probably hate me for talking about this, but I basically left it that I was going to catch a carp out of the River Thames. Um, bad call on my part. Hard work. Yeah, because I, I started a campaign and it's not been that enjoyable. No. Do you know what I mean? And now I'm in a, a difficult predicament where I have to fulfil... Uh, this and I have to do this and I'm fishing now for the wrong I'm doing this for the wrong reasons yeah 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 you know but you know that I know that I've seen you getting your bait prepped and getting ready you have correct you have mate I didn't want to be going at 2-3 yeah. o'clock in the morning to go and bait up spots in the Thames and then to fish it in flood in really cold conditions where I've got no previous experience of it and yeah. I've basically I've probably set myself up for a fall here um that's because it's. I deem it as work. I'm doing it as work. Yeah. It's, it's not a, a choice thing, you know. Um, yeah. I've had some good, good campaigns though last year. What we've not been able to get into Europe, I did get a ticket on a lake. Again, we've spoke about it. I won't say too much because we have filmed it. I found a, a lovely lake, mm. which brought me very much back to those early years with Tom where although I haven't dug swims and stuff, I've kind of, it's not exclusive either. There are other members, but people choose not to fish this particular water on, on the, the place where it is. But it's not your classic campaign of that's a named fish, it comes out. There is no names. Year, you know there I mean? is no names. And that was the big thing for me, you know. There's nothing on the internet about it. No. You speak to the other members, they can all get their phones out and show me what's in the other lake on, on the... But on, not that one. No. Nah. A couple of one, you know, I say a couple. One has he's shown me a few fish he's caught, and that's fueled me a little bit. And um, we've been able to cross reference a couple. He's had one, I've had. Mm. Um, there's another gentleman on there which I haven't quite worked out yet because he just will not engage with me at all. I've, the the best I've got out of him. Dan's met him a few times as well. This is the best I've got out of him. A nod, mm -hmm. the nod. Mm -hmm. So he either really dislikes me, yeah, um, it could be, he is either just has really poor communication skills, possibly, or he knows something. He knows, mate. He, he knows there's something in there. Because, mate, you, if you watch this bloke fish, he will sit out. He's never done a night. He only fishes days. And he sits out in some, I've seen him in some horrific conditions, sitting in the teeth of the wind, just staring. And he's fueling me, like even though he won't talk to me. And I've tried engaging with him, but you know there's something in there. That I don't know. You do. I he's ho there. I doing hope. That. I hope. And it doesn't need to be particularly. But I just for for the, for the fish I've caught and the and the lovely time I've had doing it, observing them, watching them, introducing the bait, getting spots going, getting spots cleared off. I've just really enjoyed it. Mm. It's been so refreshing. Because I, one of the things, I, I, jealousy is a horrible word, but one of the things I, and resent is also bad, but one of the things I feel I haven't got, but a lot of the other lads here have got, is they have managed to pick waters that they enjoy fishing, and they come into the office after an overnight or after the weekend, and they're all like, we're all talking, and they're like, yeah, I went back down, got back in this swim, yeah, got back onto, this spot's working, and my bait over is working, and they've got something that I've, really lacked ever since Kevin and I fished a pit together and that is somewhere to keep going yeah. and learning and yeah. understanding and and I've I've got it I had it again last year with this this particular venue and I hope it it turns out to be a really nice film and that and we'll get it wrapped up this spring and stuff but Fingers that was enjoyable crossed. Hassan that was yeah. like as opposed to a standalone adventure yeah it has been like a back to a, a kind of campaign and stuff yeah I was going to talk to you about influence, mate. So during all this time when things are changing, things are going on, there's developments within your role, your your influence, has it always been sort of an internal thing or have you looked at sort of other companies, for example, that are doing things and, and sort of looked at, to use their influence or, or, or where's <coughs> that all come from? Um, a lot of it is Kev. Yeah. If you're talking the business, Kev influences me. I'm not one of these people who sits there and um, I, I haven't read the marketing books. No, that's what I mean. That is really bad. I feel bad saying that. I haven't. 
No. I once joined this like thing, like this like some guy basically. If you pay us twenty nine ninety nine a month, we will change your mind. And I like joined it, and he sent that much junk mail. Oh, I just no. so I no, I haven't read or watched or I haven't really had any external influences. I've worked on the basis, the simple principle that we make carp fishing equipment. It is really good. Mm. We've got it in loads of shops all over Europe. Just need to tell everyone about it. Rightly or wrongly, ignorantly or naively, I've just always thought like that. Like, we've got this new thing getting launched. How can we portray it to the end user in the best possible way that they will take note of it and potentially go and buy it? I've never felt I need much more guidance. Yeah. And then when things like social media come along, where I was out of my depth, because we've all dabbled it. There's lads here that were once upon a time in social media yeah. where they like literally just knew how to put a post, post up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was it. So that when it got to the point where it became a integral and important part of the business, you bring in an expert. Yeah. Same with the videography and stuff. Same with with all of it. You bring in experts, which is not me. You know, so we've now got experts in in those things. With the product development, yes, I look and know what other companies are launching, but mm. it becomes dangerous, Hassan. You know, whether it be product development or marketing, it becomes dangerous that you're just copying and you're becoming me too. And yeah, it, it, I'm, t I'm going off on tangents now, but like, I suppose the best example I could give you is like, I would love to, follow Ali Hamidi on Instagram. Right. I can't. I can't do it because I don't want to be influenced by him. Right, yeah. Now, that might come across as really weird because he's like, he's looking after the marketing of Corda and I should really be keep, but I don't because mm. I don't want to, I don't want him. <sighs> do you get what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. Because I otherwise I, I'm fearful that I will start it becomes, copy in or yeah. it be become too similar yeah. and i haven't had to need to do it till this point so i'm not going to start doing it now and and the same applies to a lot of those high profile anglers like pictures for example i don't follow mark because i don't want to yeah i'd love to know what he's catching the same as joe blogs off the street i follow loads of people yeah, and yeah. it's lovely to know what they're catching and from that point of view i'd love to know but i don't really want that influence you can't yeah. unsee it, can you? Nah, I, I think it can be detrimental. Yeah. I think you it's more important you worry about... What's at home? Yeah, worry about yourself. So who is influencing me? Like I say, Kev, the, the lads at work here, mm. they influence me massively. That A lot of them are a lot younger than me, but I still like, wow, like you, Ollie, immensely. Yeah. Um, it's definitely a youthful department, mate. I remember coming in and thinking, oh, I'm old here, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Get him in the podcast studio. Yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, it's a fur. Oh, grand! There's a lot of ideas and a lot of. But as you say, I think one of the main things, and this is me coming in from an external, is like the energy and concentration is within, not looking at what other people are doing. Nah, I, I, I yes, I watch Corder's films, Fox's films, yeah. whoever's films. I watch those films, but. I know what product they're launching, but I'm not like on every tender hook. Like yeah. the moment they launch this film, right? We're going to do the same film. And I think if I'm honest, it's, it's a success of Nash. Yeah. If you look at Kev, if you look at the innovation, the key word being innovation, he spent his life innovating fishing tackle, bringing out revolutionary items of tackle that will catch people more fish. You know, if his business model was just watch what Fox do and anything Fox do, I'm going to copy it. Yeah. He, he wouldn't have created what he's created. He's created it on innovation. And I can only relate the same to the marketing department in that if when I joined, I was just constantly looking at what Cord or Fox or Gardner or Solar were doing, yeah. would we be where we are today? I don't think so. I no. think it's, you know, th simple things like, you know, I always think like, go. let's go back 10 years ago to when Urban Bank started. Yeah. Instead of Urban Banks, if we'd have produced a series called Alan Goes Day Ticket Fishing, yeah. and Alan went to the, the likes of Linear or Bluebell or whatever, hi, my name's Alan Blair, and today I'm down at Linear Fisheries, and I'm going to show you how to put three rods on a spot. 
would people have watched it? Would people have started following those videos? Mm-hmm. Or would they have gone, mate, like, who the fuck are you? Like, you're not Danny Fairbrush. You're not Kevin Nash. You're some kid that's now on my yeah. TV screens proclaiming, you know... A, I wasn't proficient enough at slamming three rods tram lined on a spot at 25 wraps. Yeah. Like, so I'm out of my depth anyway. So me, Winston and Ollie, mainly Winston, Winston was like, look Al, you've come from a background of fishing these park lakes in Milton Keynes. You still love getting on the train and going into London and fishing these kind of... You're really good with the general public and just speaking to people and having... Co- Let's film that. Yeah. Yeah, play to your strengths. You yeah, can't we play to our strengths, Hassan. Yes, yeah. you what? can't out cord a cord or you can't out fox fox. Yeah. We are Nash. Yeah, we are. yeah, I like that. What we've sort of failed to mention is that within all this time, mate, you've become a director, mm-hmm. haven't you? So obviously your progression's been into into product development. Any other segues in any other parts? Not really. Uh, at some point, I uh, we touched on it earlier. I can't even remember the year. Yeah. I can remember the night it happened, but I can't remember which year it was. At some point, I've obviously proved to Kev that it's more than a job. Yeah, It's become a way of life. I'm putting everything I can into it. I'm conscious of bigger things in my individual role, like the actual company. Mm. Um, I'm I care. I actually care. Like, it's not great. When am I getting paid again? Yeah. Uh, can you give me some more money? Like, yeah. I deserve a pay rise. Like, I've never asked for a pay no. rise. I've just literally embraced it. And he, as you could look at this one of two ways. I look at it both ways. He's gone, wow. Thank you, Alan. Like, thank you. You know, you have made a difference and Mm. for that, you will be rewarded. Or he's gone, I need to make sure I don't lose him. You know, and both of those decisions, I hope it was both of those, were the right decision for him to make at the time because me and Dan were only talking about it recently and me and Kev talk about it a lot. Everyone's replaceable. Yeah. And also everyone's got a price. Mm. You know, I like to argue that I haven't. But like, let's be frank. Like, if we're talking like the most ridiculous, what's stuff, the figure? Th- if I was, if I was some real wedged up investor <coughs> and I wanted to pull you across, what number would I have to? There isn't one. There's got to and be, and that's a what number. Dan was saying to me. And I was arguing it, and then I thought about it, and I was like, well, yeah, it probably is. What are you saying? Ten mil? More. 50 mil? Oh, it's, I don't want to talk about oh, it. Because it's near 50 mil, though. <laughs> no, I've it's not down. near 50. I've got him down. It's not near 50. It it's, goes back to that loyalty thing. It goes yeah. back to morals, you know. It goes back to, what's the saying? Some in the hand that feeds you. Don't or, buy the hand that feeds you. Don't buy the fucking hand that feeds you. Anyway, so that's why. So, yeah, anyway, Kev and Sarah, they took me out for a beautiful Italian and we had a bottle of Moe and they, over the table thanked me for my hard work and asked, told me that they would like to make me operations director, which to this day is a bit of a, it isn't now. Now where the company's at now, we mm. are like big, like really big. Um, but back then, I often sort of thought to myself, is this a scapegoat kind of like title that because they say operations director, it means anything to do with the operation. And I often felt like that. It would well, be like Jack of all. Yeah, involved. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, we're going back a few years now. You know, I kind of Kev would confide in me with most things, if not everything. I would have to give my opinion on that. I'd have to really think carefully about that opinion to make sure I was saying the right things. Um, nowadays, it's different. I still retain that title. I'm not a great operations director. I'm not. I know I'm not um, because. Why do you say that? Because, and I, I've not argued with Kev over this, but we've discussed it a lot where he'll say, you need to up your game and be operations director. And I'll, and I'll you know, argue back with him and go, I feel I could, but I can't redevelop your clothing range or I can't be involved in these films. Any, I, you know, I've just been frank with him and said, look, Kev, you will get 110 out of me till the day I die forever for Nash for you but I can't be what 
is deemed as the ultimate operations director because I don't feel I'm doing the role of an operations director. You know, you can't... If we go back, we talked... If you go, Kev buys fishery. Yeah. Alan has to now liaise, manage, organise creation. I've said, that's not the role of an operations director. No. Like, if you take the clothing... Yeah. An operations director wouldn't, you know... I've recently redeveloped an entire... Two ranges in the, yeah. in the like. That's not the role of an operations director. I'm not moaning. I've got the best job yeah. ever. I'm just saying I know as an individual, if I look at the title I have hanging over me, mm. I don't think I'm a very good operations director. And also, if you were an operations director and you were removed from all the other things that you were involved in, I don't think the brand is as polished and rounded as it has been, has it? Because let's face it, mate, what do you, if you're not there doing, because you do a lot, the boys do a lot in terms of filming, but in terms of sort of figureheading stuff. Yeah. Kev always said to me, like, years ago, he's like, I'm getting old, I'm not fishing like I was used to, the business needs me to be replaced. And that was, so it's like, he, he's asked three things of me really over the years. <laughs> yeah. One was marketing. Yeah. Two was product development. And then three was that phrase you've just used, which was to become him in terms mm. of, you know, back in the day, it was Kevin Nash who was the, 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 the face. And I've just tried so hard to not let him down, not let the business down and try and be those be an integral part of those three areas um and that's why i can sit here and say hand on heart i don't feel i'm a fantastic operations director because i feel i've done a really good job in marketing a really good job in product development and a really good job in becoming what kevin used to be and you know being that person at shop days welcoming giving mm. everyone the time of day at fisheries in sainsbury's at the weekend i was, someone wants to talk about fishing for 20 minutes, they're going to absolutely get 20 minutes of my time on a Saturday or whatever. So, yeah, it goes back to that same thing I said, this podcast, last podcast, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. Just try your hardest. Like, You've done well, mate. I can um, I have to say, even from the very first experience I think I had meeting you, like... There was a lot of like, well, was he going to be the man that he like comes across as really enthusiastic, really full of energy, like loads of time for everyone? A hundred percent, mate. I can honestly say, like, yeah, Im massively impressive and uh, utmost admiration for, for for everything you've done there. And it's all, yeah, it's not fake, mate. It's real. It's very real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ever been? Oh, this is horrible to say, but ever, ever been tempted to go elsewhere? No. Not over all those no, years. Not once. There's been times when I, I didn't think I could do it anymore. Mm. Not to go elsewhere because it just got too much. No, in terms of elsewhere, I'm opening it up to any other industry, any no. other thing. No, no, no not, not since I've been here. No, even the like I, where I was going with that was there's times when I'm just like it's too much. Yeah. I've had enough. Like, but then I go and speak to Kev, and we talk, and he sort it out. Yeah, and there's a solution and there's answers and you know if we just if we do this and this and this and it always sorts itself out always but even at that point I've never gone and spoke to Kev and was going to say yeah Kev it's all too much I think I'm just going to like become a full time angler or Kev I realise now I could earn a lot of money doing tutorials so I'm going to leave now like never not once never crossed my mind I just I felt like it's all a bit too much mm. I'm just going to talk to him and, and sort it out and stuff. Um, lockdown last year, I thought Nash, I didn't know what was going to happen. Mm. So I I think we said it on the Christmas uh, special, Christmas special yeah, yeah. which wasn't a joke, Hassan. Sell water. Alan Blair Yeah, because I, I'm like, I'm trying to be like pragmatic. Is that the right word? Yeah. I'm looking at the situation going, what if the fucking, what if this goes like big time bang, then what am I going to do? Now I'm really lucky. I've got a house, mm. family, I've got my father, still got Kev, I've got really good friends. So I feel like really stable in myself. But if Nash goes bang, if the fishing industry goes bang, if the world goes bang, 
that's where I come up with genuinely. People must think, what a twat, as if he actually thought that. But I did, Hassan. I thought, if it goes the worst it possibly can and the world crumbles, people are still going to seek happiness. They're still going to want to dance. They're still going to want to sing. They're still going to want to hug. And there will be some kind of scene. Scene. Yeah. And I will be there. And if needs be, I'll be the person selling bottled water. You'd smash it, mate. <laughs> you would smash it. You're an absolute mentalist. A, I'm going to be quite frank. Forget the cameras. You're an absolute nutter, mate. But brilliant. Like, they do say there is a fine line between, like, genius and madman, don't they? And, like, I, <laughs> I've seen both sides of it and thought, there's no way that anybody could do that. But you do do it, mate. And it's, it's testament to you because, yes, there is the passion. Yes, there is the energy. But there is something at your very core that I honestly have the utmost admiration for and anybody who's brilliant in their craft has got it do you know what I mean I don't know Thank what you, you can't so. put a finger on it I can't because no. I don't know I just and that's no BS for the cameras at all mate like yeah. I don't know what it is but yeah it's it's massively impressive F- for you and this is personal how old are you now mate that's a horrible 37. question 37 so 37 mm. did you think that you would be this successful um, at the age of 37 and achieve what you'd have achieved y- yeah but just not doing this. And I didn't know. So I'm going to say that's yes, but I don't know the answer. If you know what I mean? I knew growing up, I'll go back to this money on trees thing. Mm. I knew I wanted nice things in life. And I knew there was... That's a, a big motivation, isn't it? Nice things. Nice things. It's a massive motivation. Massive. Because, you know, I, f- I don't know if we touched on it or not, but mum and dad did all they could. Yeah. But in my head back then, I knew they'd done all they could, but it weren't enough. Mm. How come those kids in school have got that? How come those kids in school have gone to Disneyland? How come I haven't? You know, and it all boiled down to money. Yeah. Make no bones about it. Yeah. So from such a young age, and my brother's the same and my sister's the same, you know, we just realised that two things. Money don't grow on trees. Mm. We were never going to get an inheritance that was going to like see us through. It weren't happening. So we're going to have to work really hard. And number two, which is probably, and it is more important than the money. Number two was I watched mum and dad go to work and do everything they could to provide. And they did fantastically well. But they fucking hated doing it. Mm. You know, so they go to work, hated their jobs, hated their jobs, hated their... Maybe not mum so much, but certainly dad, you know, and he was the the, the breadwinner. Yeah, the main breadwinner. He was the main breadwinner. And you asked me before, what did he do? I don't really know, computer software something, but it was, it paid well, you know. Yeah. And, um, but he hated it. Yeah. Um, And I and my brother and my sister were like, nah, uh uh-uh. We're going to go and earn money and we're going to earn it Mm. on our terms doing something we like, you know. I probably much more so than my sister and my brother to a degree yeah i do want the 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 really nice things i don't know why i don't know why nice things are nice aren't they like, I don't know. Well, you've had nice holidays, Asan. Do you nice want to holidays? go Skegness? Do you want to take your family to Skegness? Or do I you want to take them to the Maldives? No, honestly, honestly, mate, Honestly, I'd love to take the girls to Disneyland. Yeah, Don't get me wrong. But in terms of, for me, I, th- I think I've changed in terms of not a lot is really for me anymore. It's the girls, man. It's the focus. I'd, okay, I'd so, love to take them So away. on that basis then, yeah, I don't want to go to Disneyland but, either. But it's not cheap. Oh, it's not cheap. No, it's a big old holiday, that. But I wouldn't... I'd say the experience, and you've had loads of adventures and stuff, the experience is probably more important than the tangible sort of value of whatever's put on that goods. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If I could take them to Skegness and they did some crabbing for the first time and it was like, that would be mega. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Obviously not Disneyland mega, so there yeah. is a trade-off. But yeah, and that's the point. Like, that's the point. And, yeah, that might be the wrong way to go through your life, but it's just who I am. Mate, um, yeah, there's no right way to go about it, mate, nah. not at all. But so that, It's a driving force for yeah. me. It's a driving force. You know, I, I, yeah, I just want a really nice house. I want a beautiful carp lake at the bottom of my garden. Is or, that what you want the lake? Of cool. course. Who does it? Like, I, I, I always say it. It's a bit like the Chloe thing in the bin driven. I thought everyone wanted that. Yeah. But I don't know if they do now anymore. Like I thought everyone wanted a good career. I thought everyone wanted to get the best out of them and be yeah. the best. But I don't know if they do. And I think Kev also, like, 
how can I sit here and say I don't want, and I don't just want one Lake Hassan, I want loads of lakes. Do you? Yeah. Do you not? I want a lake, but I wouldn't want a lake as in like... But how big's the lake? It's a big lake. But there you go, that's not cheap, Hassan. No, it's not cheap, so but I don't need 10 I'm lakes. Ta- I'm happy with like one nice yeah, lake. Yeah, but I'd like, like one nice lake at my garden, and then yeah. I'd like somewhere else off my garden, another complex of lakes that were a profitable business for Right, me. okay. Wouldn't you? No. Why? I don't want the business side. You can have that. Okay, what about just for friends and family then? Yeah, that'd be my lake in my back garden. No, they can't fish there. Would you, I wouldn't have a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Lads, get in. You yeah, I don't know where this is going, but I, yeah, I just... No, it's interesting. I like that, mate. I like knowing, like getting to the, how people are different, isn't it? It's different people's motivations. Yeah. For you... What, I mean, there's an infinite amount of possibilities, but what for you are you still craving in terms or looking towards in terms of the future? Daily happiness, Mm. daily success. And I think the biggest thing having now really grafted is some kind of exit from now this is where kev will disagree with me and we've actually spoke again about it again about it at the weekend i thought and he's usually right and this time he fucking probably is going to be right i thought what i wanted was to carry on working really hard for a number of more years Mm. till i'm for example 50 i picked this magic number yeah and then i thought after that i'd just go fishing yeah but he said to me he's like that ain't you and I think you kind of hinted it. it's the same. And I, I don't know. But, yeah, I don't know, mate. I but really don't know. It goes back to, sorry, it goes back to what you are saying earlier about, like, do you not have these long-term plans? I thought I did. I thought it was as simple as, yep, I'm going to work stupidly hard until mm. I'm 50. And then I can change my life because security, my kids are of an age now where they've gone to uni or further education or they've got a job and... Um, I thought me and Chloe could go away and just embrace life more than I'm doing at the moment in terms of, yeah, a lot of fishing, (laughs) a lot of travelling the world and stuff. But as I said, he's usually right. He said to me, and he has said it to me a few times, and I was in John Bailey's presence recently. I went for a day's fishing with him and and John asked me a similar question and he said, I know you well enough, Alan. Kev says it. There's something in you. There's a desire to work and be successful and so maybe they're right so i don't know do i think will i get to 50 is probably a better question you'll get to 50 will i i don't know yeah yeah you won't stop though mate no but who knows i could be wrong but uh yeah mate you are yeah force mate 50 wow you got a few years though yet mate haven't you but in terms of actual landmarks anything else you don't want to be kev own it all and i don't know have it not really, no, because he's he, a deal has already been done where he's looked after me so well mm. in terms of... It goes back to that very first one of three questions. What are you going to be doing in five years' time? Well, I'm going to be working for myself, Kev. It, I am working for myself. Mm. I am. I'm working with great people, but I feel like Nash, as much as it's not like to the same degree as Kev's, it is his business. Yeah. It does feel like a bit of it, or the, at least the work I've done since I've been here, the last 14 years, warrant it enough to be part of my business. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean, mate. 14 yeah. years, is that what it is? Yeah, 14 years and some months. Half, 14 and a half years, something like that. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, I feel like, yeah, I come to work. Yes, Kevin created it in that but for the last 14 years i've treated it like it is my own to a degree yeah so you're right that's why you've been good that's why it's been successful mate i think um 2021 yep what's on the agenda for now it is a bit mad um get out of this uh period studio <laughs> studio <laughs> no I, oh, <coughs> everybody's um Everybody's very busy and everyone's very stressed and I feel for everyone right mm. about now, whether that's Chloe who's having to homeschool, whether that's people in the NHS, whether that's 
staff that have been furloughed and, you know, it's not enough money for them to pay their bills and stuff. Whether it's Kevin Nash, who has got a lot of stress and burdens on his show. I feel for the whole world because it's no... I, I, unless you live in New Zealand, <laughs> no one's having an easy time at the no. moment. Um, I want everyone to get through it. And I want everyone to come out the other side and I want the DAFs to pop up and the bluebells to pop up and spring to come back around. And I, I just want a bit of, I want everyone, not me selfishly saying, but I want to be able to go part. I want everyone to get back to some kind of normality. Um, I want to carry on in the vein that this year has started in terms of specifically with you know, the communications I'm having with the likes of Dan and Henry and Colin and James and all those people where we're making really good decisions for the business and I can see the I can see what we need to do and where we need to do. We just need to we just need to execute those plans and that and the business will continue going so in, in the right direction. That would give me great comfort and happiness. Um yeah. Few fishing trips, take the girls away that have been cooped up like so many other children all yeah. over the world, and yeah, just a bit of normality, Hassan. You know, Kev said to me at the weekend, he said, "Al, we could just get on a plane now," and he's right, but we can't. No, you know, and I said to him, "Why don't we go for a walk around Malden Pit?" And he was like, "Yeah." And we were both really happy about that, and we were like, "Let's go and have a walk around there." We haven't been there for six or seven years. Yeah. I spoke to him this morning. He's like, we fucking can't, can we? And we can't because we shouldn't be outside together walking. We shouldn't travel the 25 minutes or whatever it is. And it's just a big challenge for everyone at whatever level you are, whatever age you are. Um, it affects you, definitely. Yeah, I, I can't believe we're talking about COVID. Bullshit, COVID. Go away, COVID. But yeah, that's, that's how I'm sure anyone listening to this is feeling just ride it out guys like yeah. just ride it out because when it's gone we'll all be like that bloody hell what a shit year that was and we can just go and get back on with mm. doing nice things again plans post covid same fishing venues yeah Euro bank? yeah that's oh mate the plant has and like i don't want to disclose anything here but it's mind-blowing you know yeah. we're never sure one thing we're blessed with, we're never short of creativity <laughs> And yeah. ideas, some of them are really crazy and far-fetched. And, yeah, it's just having the freedom at the moment to be able to to do any of that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I've got lots of exciting things lined up. Um, Mega, mate. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Blair, it has been a brilliant... Nearly three hours, mate, we've been here. Thank you. Thanks, um, guys. Mega, as always. Um, we're definitely going to come back with another episode all about Eurobanks and Urban Banks specifically, mm -hmm. mate. But those two, I've really enjoyed. So thank you very much for doing Thanks, it. Thanks, bro. Thank you guys for listening and watching. And we'll see you soon. See you later, guys. Thank you.